Keratitis covered, a latest update. I am Anand Mani, founder of RatedDoctor.com. Rated Doctor is a marketing platform for doctors. There's no joining fee and basic membership is free. Today, we're going to ra cover a range of uh, topics pertaining to the corneal infections, from herpes simplex keratitis to bacterial keratitis, fungal keratitis, and peripheral ulcerative keratitis and neuropathic keratitis. Uh, I'd like to thank Age for Pharma for sponsoring this event. Initially, we're going to have Mr. Usman Sheikh saying a few words with Age for Pharma, followed by presentations by Professor Harminder S. Dua and Professor Dalia Said. And we're going to have a Q&A after each presentation. Format, please ask questions via the Q&A box. You can always chat with the other attendees and moderators via the chat box. The CPD points has been approved by the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. We are still awaiting approval from the General Optical Council for optometrists. Uh, if your question hasn't been answered during Q&A, please send me an email to anand.m at ratedoctor.com and we'll get back to you. With this, I'd like to hand over to Mr. Usman Sheikh, Marketing Director of H4 Pharma to say a few words. Thank you very much, Dr. Anand. We really appreciate that. So my name is Usman Sheikh. I'm the uh, head of marketing at Agay for Pharma. Firstly, thank you for everyone for attending, for taking time out your busy schedules to join us here today. This is our first webinar of the year, and we have many more planned, including physical meetings. So we will keep you uh, updated with those. For those who aren't familiar with Agay for Pharma, we are a European pharmaceutical manufacturer. We've been in the market for over 70 years now. We are a family owned and operated organization and we're available in 47 countries uh, in different therapeutic areas with a key focus on ophthalmology. A little bit about uh, one of our key products that we'd like to uh, highlight, uh, which is in line with uh, today's talk, which is acyclovir, a GAFA 30 mg per gram eye ointment, 3% eye ointment, which is a first line treatment for hepatic keratitis. It is the only approved treatment for babies, nursing mothers, and pregnant women. And it's the only acyclovir eye ointment available in the UK. And more importantly, it's covered by the NHS drug tariff. I'd like to thank everyone again, and especially our speakers, Professor Dua and uh, Professor Dahlia, and I would say enjoy the session. Thank you. Now to our first presentation, herpes simplex keratitis by Professor Dahlia Said. Uh, Professor Dahlia Said is a consultant ophthalmologist and coronal specialist. She's also the honorary clinical associate Professor of Ophthalmology at Cairo in Egypt. She has over 70 publications to her credit. She is actively involved in multi-center studies on infectious keratitis in ocular stem cell transplantation. With this, I hand over to Professor Dalia Said. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to try and cover uh, herpes simplex and simplify it as much as I can. Uh, so 90% of adults are still positive of a herpes simplex antigen, and about 60% of children by the age of five also have had HSV type 1 infection, but uh, less than 1% would have had primary ocular disease. Um, the clinical manifestations in units, you can have a primary herpes in units, or a, usually it can become with, uh, with blepharitis, conjunctivitis, even keratitis. And if uh, you get a stromal keratitis, then you probably would have had an intrauterine infection leading to an immune-mediated disease, which is very, very rare in your needs. Primary uh, herpetic infections can happen in children and young adults, and the most common is the recurrent herpetic infections. We because the uh, virus becomes latent in both the trigeminal as well as the ciliary ganglia. In primary neonatal infection, 80% is a type 1 infection, and herpes simplex type 2 represent 20% of cases. Uh, there is quite significant mortality and morbidity, and there are ocular uh, lesions can be in the form of blepharitis, just exactly like primary ocular infection, blepharitis, conjunctivitis, whether it's follicular, 
or it can be aggressive as a, with a pseudo membrane. You can get keratitis in the form of SPKs, microdendrites. Uh, you can get quite a bit of periocular skin infection with vesicles, uh, but they do heal without any scars. And these are examples of the hemorrhagic vesic uh, vesicles, which can happen uh, on the lids, blepharitis, follicular conjunctivitis. You can see the follicles are mainly, mainly seen in the lower lids. But you can also get these atypical forms or uh, microdendrites. And don't forget, you can also get the, the dendrites on the conjunctiva. So don't only examine the cornea, but look in the conjunctiva. You can get a typical a hepatic dendrite, and that usually the ulcer stains with fluorescein. But uh, you can use also the rose bengal dye, which can uh, stain the devitalized cells. So how do we diagnose herpes? Usually the history of a previous herpes, so very important to ask about this. There is a classic dendritic pattern with a terminal bulb stain with fluorescein like this one, and it is usually depressed in herpes simplex. And also don't forget to check the sensation before, before you put your anesthetic. And usually the diagnosis is clinical. You can also get the stromal keratitis or uh, disciform keratitis, and these are uh, resulting from immune deposits from the antigen-antibody reaction, and then uh, the immune deposits, uh, uh, this deposit as a ring, and you can get central edema within that ring. You can get KPs, you can get endotheliitis uh, or localized stromal edema. These are all forms of uh, stromal keratitis. Um, and when do you actually need a lab diagnosis in herpes? When there is not a, a, a clinical pattern of a simple dendrite, especially if the patient's been had steroids, you might get a sort of a geographical ulcer like this, but that doesn't necessarily uh, have, have to be a herpes. If there is also new patterns uh, with a history of HSK, but uh, the new lesions do not have the actual picture of a dendrite. If the patient is a contact lens where it's a very, very important differential diagnosis and can look like a herpes, that's a, a very important um, masquerade. And if you give, you've given the antiviral and there is no response or no improvement on your antiviral treatment, and in viral endotheliitis with hypertensive uveitis, you can take an aqueous tap and send for PCR. So these are the situations where you think you might want a laboratory diagnosis. What do we do? We do mostly PCR. It's quite sensitive, 100% sensitive, but it's not very specific. However, the commercial available PCR techniques can quantify the amount of viral load. And if there is a high viral load, that means probably an active infection. Now, viral culture is 100% specific, but it's not very sensitive and it takes a very long time. So it's not done routinely in hospitals. There are other mechanisms such as immune histochemistry or looking for viral antibody, which is mainly as an exclusion technique uh, in uh, children and young adults. Now, in vivo confocal microscopy, it's very important to, uh, to uh, discard acanthamoeba and fungal, but it is a very expensive kit and it's only available in tertiary referral center. So acanthamoeba will appear uh, as these bright spots or double walled cyst or signature shaped rings. Uh, and if you see that in clusters, then this is not a viral infection, uh, especially it can, clinically look like a viral dendrite, like you can see here, or if the patients had steroids, you can even get uh, that pattern, uh, which looks like a geographical ulcer, but actually this patient had acanthamoeba. How do we manage HSK? A combination usually of antivirus or steroids, depending on uh, what kind of lesions you've got, and I'll try and simplify that. So for epithelial keratitis, acyclovir ointment uh, five times a day for two weeks, is a standard. Another option is your Gansaclovir gel, Vergans gel, which is also five times a day for two weeks. Uh, in the USA, they commonly use trifluorothymidine 1% up to two hourly. And people have looked and whether to do the brightening to reduce the viral load or not. And uh, the meta-analysis uh, were not conclusive, but they didn't say that it's not 
uh, beneficial. When you do debridement, that's an advantage if you want to go and do some um, lab testing to check if it's a hepatic infection. Um, can we give oral acyclovir in epithelial keratitis? Yes, we can also treat epithelial keratitis with 400 milligrams uh, acyclovir five times a day for a week. Uh, but that is usually instead of topical treatment, not additional to topical treatment, especially if it's a child or a mentally challenged adult when you don't think they will put the ointment uh, or the drops. In unresponsive epithelial keratitis, however, that's a different uh, scenario. So the unresponsive patient can be due to non-compliance. They're not taking it five times a day, maybe once a day, twice a day. You've got to take a quite a good history from the patients to see if they're compliant or not. You have to exclude unrecognized stromal element because if there is a stromal element that can affect the healing of the epithelial keratitis, and you've got to exclude neurotrophic and metahepatic and drug toxicity. Remember, the long-term acyclovir can be quite toxic to the epithelium, so you can't really keep giving it for a long period of time. And uh, the last thing is... Uh, drug resistance. Who gets resistance? Usually patients who are immune compromised or atopic, and that's usually due to mutation in virus thymidine kinase gene, which is an important gene, uh, which is important to activate uh, both acyclovir and gancyclovir. If you have resistance, what do you do? You stop your treatment for 24 hours and do some scraping and uh, the, dividing the area of the ulcer and send for PCR or even viral culture. And your options will be there only you will use the oral acyclovir in high dose, 800, five times a day, oral valacyclovir, one gram for three days, or even some people use two grams uh, and topical foscarnet, uh, which can be used up to two hourly for two weeks. The foscarnet has a different mechanism. Uh, it, it affects the viral DNA straight away. It does not need activation by viral thymidine kinase. So sometimes it works when acyclovir and valacyclovir do not work. In stromal keratitis, you need to use topical steroid under cover of antiviral treatment. Uh, you have to very gradually taper the steroids, even after complete resolution. If you suddenly stop the steroids, you're very likely to get a recurrence. And the head study says that if you've got an epithelial disease with a stromal disease, you can delay the steroids and just give the antiviral to start to try and heal the epithelial disease first. So what do we give? We usually tend to give prednisolone acetate 1%, uh, preservative-free uh, most of the time, with a topical acyclovir five times a day and oral acyclovir 800 five times a day, especially if you have keratitis plus endotheliitis and uveitis. So in, in keratitis alone, you don't have to have the additional oral, but if you've got uveitis with it or endotheliitis with it, it's also good to add the oral acyclovir. And if the patient is a steroid responder, uh, some people have said that you can use a cyclosporin instead of steroids, or you can give uh, anti-glaucoma medications while you're giving your steroids. Don't forget that uh, acyclovir and gancyclovir can be nephrotoxic. So if the patient's got kidney problems, you have to reduce the dose, even half the dose. Um, they can cause light sensitivity, can cause GIT symptoms, uh, headaches, dizziness, and sometimes uh, some blood diseases. So watch for these. They're not very often, but you have to be aware of them. I'm just going to take you very quickly through the head studies, which are the hepatic eye disease studies, which is the way we follow uh, our treatment protocols now uh, in managing hepatic keratitis. So if you had a, patients had any form of ocular herpes, uh, acyclovir 400 twice a day significantly reduces their cancer. We tend to usually start them on long-term uh, maintenance dose if they've had more than two attacks in a year. This is uh, the stromal keratitis group have greater benefit than the epithelial keratitis group. Number two, the steroids were found to be very effective in active stromal keratitis. And if you've got a combination of epithelial and stromal disease, postponing the, storm, uh, the steroids uh, did not show much difference in outcome at six months. Uh, 
what about active HSV stomal keratitis? Uh, do we have to add acyclovir? Well, they found that people who've been treated by steroids and trifluothymidine, so antiviral, did not really have uh, much benefit of adding the acyclovir oral. However, in iritis, the oral acyclovir uh, 400 five times a day were sure to be beneficial. If you're having an epithelial keratitis, which is already on the antiviral, uh, uh, the adding of acyclovir tablets did not alter uh, the subsequent development of stomal and uh, keratitis or iritis. So you don't have to do that. If you've, your patients had previous stomal, uh, but not epithelial disease, that in remarkably increased the risks of recurrence of the disease. And obviously, the number of past episodes was, put, uh, was uh, very closely associated with even more recurrences. They did not show any uh, effect of psychological stress on exposure, contact lens wear, systemic illness on triggering of HSK. However, other uh, papers have showed that HSK, HSV1 specifically, can stay dormant not only in the trigeminal ganglia, but also in the ciliary ganglia, which is got in the autonomic component, and that can be triggered by stress and uh, also with hormonal changes. So that still is a bit controversial. Metahepatic keratitis is mainly due to loss of sensation. So what you do with these, you've got to stop all your drops, uh, use hourly preservative-free lubricants, you can use autologous serum or nerve growth factors, and there are many surgical modalities which Prof. Dura will be talking about in his neurotrophic keratitis talk. Thank you for your attention. Those of topical steroids in combination of epithelial and stomal disease of HSV. Um, well, it depends really if you've got a stomal disease and epithelial disease, you want to try and just give the antiviral first. So give you the acyclovir five times a day. As soon as you see the epithelial is closing, then you can start adding the steroids even two to three times a day, not a very high dose. But in endotheliitis, you will need a higher um, dose of steroids, so a minimum of four times a day of prednisolone, 0.5% uh, uh, preservative-free. Thank you, Professor Said, for that excellent presentation. Uh, next, we have Professor Haramida S. Dua. He's going to be talking about herpes zoster keratitis. Now, as you can all agree, it's a quite a busy slide here. Uh, Professor Dua has been a consultant ophthalmologist and professor of ophthalmology at the University of Nottingham since 1994. His specialties in cornea and anterior segment is published over 450 papers with over 25,000 citations. He's been awarded over 155 prizes, honors, and accolades. Uh, in 2019, he discovered the Dua's layer in the cornea, which has vastly improved our understanding for, of corneal lamellar surgery. In 2019, he was awarded the commander of the British Empire in the Queen's birthday honors list. With that, I'd like to invite Professor Dua for this presentation. Well, hello, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar on keratitis covered. I'd like to thank ECFA uh, for their kindness in hosting this meeting and sponsoring it. And of course, uh, Anand and colleagues who have been putting in a lot of effort uh, to get this together. So I'm going to now move on to the next virus infection, which is very common and serious, this herpes zoster keratitis. These are my declarations of interest, but none related to the subject matter of this talk. Varicella zoster virus, VZV, as it's very commonly called, is a double-stranded DNA virus, it's neurotrophic, which means it has a predilection for affecting nerves and nerve ganglia. It is the primary infection uh, that starts off in childhood. Everybody gets it more or less, it's called chicken pox. And it's nothing to do with chicken, but because the blister that appears on the skin appears like a chickpea, it was called chicken pox. It is almost universal, usually mild, can be severe, but in the immunocompromised, 
it can be fatal. And the activity waxes and wanes throughout the course of life. As we know that when you have an old infection, you see high levels of IgM antibody in the serum, but if uh, IgG antibodies, but if it's a more recent infection, then you see IgM antibodies. And whenever there is reactivation of the zoster or the chickenpox virus, the IgM titers increase in the serum. The other thing about these viruses, uh, like uh, with the simplex virus, is the propensity to latency. They sort of sit and rest in the ganglion. Uh, it's got a special predilection for the trigeminal ganglion, but they also lay dormant in any of the dorsal root ganglions. As you can see, the fifth nerve ganglion, particularly the fifth one, which is the ophthalmic division of the fifth nerve, is affected in 7 to 21% of cases. The reactivation occurs when the immunity is reduced. And this happens as we grow older. And then it manifests as another uh, infection uh, in the skin. And that is called shingles or zoster. So chickenpox virus, zoster virus, different extremes of age. You're getting the same virus with different clinical manifestations. And because the infection commonly occurs along a dermatome, as you see here, like a belt, and that's why from the word singulum, the word shingles has come, which explains the occurrence of the disease in a particular dermatome along the chest. Now, in the USA, where they have a lot of data on almost everything, they have these figures, 95% of the adults have antibodies, which means almost everybody sooner or later gets the infection. Fortunately, not everybody gets the disease. Uh, 300,000 to 500,000 people are affected every year. And the incidence of zoster, then that is the actual clinical manifestation, is four per 100,000. But importantly, as you grow older in the over 60 years age group, it is one per 100,000, one per 100. So that's quite a high incidence. So one to 4% of these people will have serious complications and not just the disease. And you will see one particular feature of zoster is the post herpetic neuralgia. And that is in 10% of the patients who get the zoster will have that. And that can be quite debilitating. In this uh, more immunocompromised individuals, it can be fatal. And that's a, a significant number of deaths uh, occurring uh, per million of the population between 0.25 to 0.7. Now, coming to the eye, 25% of herpes zoster cases, which means where it is manifest on the skin, are herpes zoster ophthalmicus, which means it's involving the eye structures. And this is usually because of the first division of the um, fifth cranial nerve, which is the the, and that itself has the, uh, the branches, and, and this is the frontal branch of the V1. And interestingly, of the herpes zoster manifestations all over the body, 50% of them will have the eyeball involved. And when the eyeball is involved, it is due to the affection or the infection coming through the nasociliary branch of the nerve, uh, which may or may not be also uh, affecting the frontal branch of the fifth cranial nerve. So we, you see that if you get to get eyeball infection, the nasociliary branch has to be involved. The clinical manifestation that we see can be acute, they can be chronic, and they can come and go. It's called relapsing. And there are five mechanisms by which they happen. Most important is the active virus replication in the tissues where the clinical features are being seen. And then it is the immune response to this virus, which is the host response. And this is usually the cell-mediated response rather than the humoral response, which is the antibody response. So the cell-mediated response is more important here. Then the third mechanism is vasculitis. The vasculitis can be both immune-mediated and direct vi virus infection. But when the vessels are obstructed, then you get the ischemic changes. And that uh, adds to the clinical features. 
nerve involvement and the nerve involvement with increased nerve firing or nerve dumbing down of sensations. So that's a, again adds to the clinical manifestation and eventually the scarring. So five main mechanisms by which the disease occurs. And we'll go through these clinical features now um, uh, quickly. And you can see the whole body, every part of the body can be affected. You can get fever, headaches, tingling, numbness along the dermatome, and then malaise and chills. So that is in the acute stage. And then paresthesias and hypersthesia before the vesicular eruption occurs can be manifested in the dermatome that is going to be affected and then other symptoms affecting the GI tract, the respiratory tract, all that can be manifestations of the disease. What we see quite often is in the skin, and there you get a rash. The rash is described as macular papilla when it is a raised flat red lesion, like you see over here, these little ones are all raised flat red lesions. It can be vesicular when it is red and it is filled with clear fluid, as you see over here. And when that clear fluid becomes white, as you see in these two bits here or over here, it's called a pustular rash. And then eventually that crusts and you get these little crusts forming. And it is considered that until all the crusts have fallen off, the condition is still infectious. So if you're treating this from a point of view of preventing spread, you should avoid direct contact with individuals until the crust has fallen off. Or if you're the doctor, then wear gloves and wash your hands. And that can take up to two weeks to completely become non-infectious. There is this sign often spoken of called Hutchinson sign. So if the tip of the, this should be nose, not nerve. If the tip of the nose is affected, that means the nasociliary nerve is affected. And if the nasociliary nerve is affected, like I said, then you know that the eyeball is also going to be affected. So invariably you will find features on the cornea and the conjunctiva. So there's a very high risk of the eyeball being affected if the tip of the nose is affected. You can get excessive lid edema, which looks like preceptal cellulitis, but often isn't, though there's no harm in giving antibiotics in these patients because sometimes you can have secondary infection. Now, whenever we look at infections of the eye lids and conjunctiva, we look at two groups of lymph nodes, the preauricular and the submandibular. From the medial or the middle half of the eye and the lids, which means the lids and the conjunctiva from the midline nasally, the drainage is to the submandibular nodes, and from the outer half of the lids and the conjunctiva, it is to the preauricular nodes. So these are the nodes one would palpate to look if there is um, any inflammation or tenderness or enlargement of the glands. And looking at the surface of the eye now, there's a wide range of manifestation. This is just to give you this pattern recognition impression of uh, what all can happen. As you can see, the list is long. Uh, conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, episcleritis, you can get uh, keratitis, uveitis, and these are examples. The diffuse congestion is conjunctivitis. Localized congestion with some elevation and tenderness is um, uh, episcleritis. Uh, flictinilo keratitis, one of the very common cause of flictinilosis is uh, herpes zoster and worldwide tuberculosis is the commonest cause of that uh, manifest. And that's an immune manifestation of the disease, not active viral uh, replication. Uh, you get uveitis, trabeculitis, choroiditis. And you, when you see things like this, you get transillumination because the pigment has fallen off and the pigment falls off because there is vasculitis of the iris vessels um, as a result of the zoster infection. And with severe uveitis, you can get a spontaneous high femur, sometimes combined with a hypopion, and then the retina manifestation, all these different forms of um, vasculitides, vein occlusions, and large ischemic areas. So as I mentioned, all these manifestations uh, are due to those five mechanisms and of course, uh, the facial nerve has been affected over here. So you get nerve palsies as well. And serious things like cavernous sinus thrombosis can also occur. So a huge range of manifestations. This is an important table. I'm not going to 
um, uh, go through every bit of this, but I'm sure this talk will be available online for you to, to look at. It's from this publication in Cornea, and it shows you the frequency of the various ocular surface manifestations and the time part at which it develops. But broadly speaking, there's two points to be made. The top four are the most common. You can see 50% almost will get punctate keratitis, pseudodendrites, stromal infiltrase, and keratouveitis. And the other point to be made is that the earlier manifestations are due to active viral replications. The later manifestations are due to the immune response or the other mechanisms that we've explained. So let's look at some of these uh, ocular manifestations quickly. Again, once you see these things and they're embedded in your mind, then you can start thinking of this uh, condition in a patient who has the other symptoms um, and signs of zoster. So coarse and fine punctate keratitis. And these are what these are. These are swollen epithelial cells. Stain with lysamine green or rose bengal, which means they are dead epithelial cells. But the areas that stain with fluorescein means those dead epithelial cells have fallen off to expose the basement membrane or the underlying bowmans. You get pseudodendrites, and they are they look very much like the zoster dendrites, or like the simplex dendrites, but they are not. And the difference is that they are on rather than in the epithelium. There is no central groove. As you see, this groove-like ulcer from which the branches come out, as Dr. Said has explained, you see in herpes simplex, but in zoster, they are elevated on the epithelium without that central groove. And you can get these stellate kind of uh, dendrites. And here, uh, some stained with fluorescein and some stained with rose bengal. And from these, you will be able to culture the zoster virus, but their response to the topical antiviral is limited compared to the simplex virus. The other causes of pseudodendrites must not be forgotten, of which acanthamoeba is a very common, uh, uncommon, but serious one. And of course, healing corneal abrasions can also cause these pseudodendrites, which disappear very quickly. But here you can see again, negative fluorescein staining. These are cells that are elevated and swollen, but not fallen off. And then areas of positive, which are the green areas staining. And here again, a lot of positive staining of an acanthamoeba pseudodendrite. Then you get these numular infiltrates, which are little coin-like roundish lesions with fuzzy borders. And you can see mostly they are subepithelian, often an immune response to viral antigens. And they can exist uh, for a long time, even after the symptoms have gone and the treatment has been relatively successful, uh, you can still see them. Very rarely they are due to the direct cytotoxic effect of the virus, but like I said, often they are due to the immune response. Now, you will see exactly the same kind of lesions during corneal graft rejection, and these are called Kratchmer spots. And the Kratchmer spots are a, a sign of graft rejection, and they can also be seen, uh, not the Kratchmer spot, but a similar lesion can also be seen in adenoviral infection. And the key point is that if they are seen in the host rim as well, then they are not rejection. But if they are seen only in the graft, then think of rejection rather than adenoviral or the numular lesions of zoster. So remember that point in mind if you see it in a patient who's had a previous graft. Then keratouveitis and endotheliitis, as you can see, sudden corneal edema, corneal decompensation, and here this iris transient illumination, as I've shown you before, iris flare and cells and keratic precipitates, all these are features of involvement of the um, uveal tissue. And here you can see even almost the, the desmus membrane seems to be detaching in an endotheliitis case, and they can affect the angle. You get trabeculitis where the pressure goes up and you can get ciliary body inflammation. And if the ciliary body inflammation is excessive, with cyclitis, the pressure can even go down. Uh, these I've mentioned shown you before, these iris pigment loss and high femur. Then serpiginous ulceration. This is, again, uh, a characteristic of both zoster and simplex. And it looks like the 
ulceration is spreading along the periphery of the cornea. And here it is stained with rose bengal. But you can see the deep melting in, that occurs in the stroma as a result of the combined virus infection and the immune response. And often, if it's extreme periphery, it is due to ischemic changes where the limbus vessels are affected and cause limbitis. And here is that example where you had extreme uh, ischemia, almost looks like a chemical burn, but this was a zoster case. There's extensive ischemia of the limbus and the corresponding part of the uh, epithelium is not healing. So all the stem cells here are gone and you can see uh, very nicely shows you the anatomical area that was served by the stem cells in the limbus over here that have been uh, affected and, and dropped off following an episode of zoster infection. Uh, you get scleritis and keratitis, and here's where the pain becomes extensive. Uh, and you can see this all this diffuse staining, uh, diffuse sort of diffuse congestion uh, uh, suggests scleritis, and there's an adjacent lesion in the limbus over here. Again, this scleritis has a very uh, prominent component of vasculitis related to the immune complex deposition. So where the antibody and antigen meet uh, at an optimal concentration, they precipitate. This immune complex attracts a lot of uh, macrophages, polymorphs, immune cells, and that causes this intense inflammation. Uh, here's the same patient with the staining, another patient with a peripheral uh, ulceration, uh, due to zoster. And these are examples of scleritis. As you can see, this nodular scleritis, as it resolves, the sclera becomes thin and eventually the uveal tissue starts to show. If there's extensive thinning, then you get staphyloma, which is ectasia of the cornea or the sclera with incorporation of the uveal tissue. And the two together, then it's called a staphyloma. Uh, you get this mucus plaque again. These are uh, uh, deposits of mucus uh, inspissated, which is semi-dried mucus. And again, these can be wiped off, showing a clean underlying epithelium. So that's the difference between uh, a pseudodendrite and a mucus plaque. But you can get that in various diffuse or linear manifestations um, on the surface of the cornea. Then you get this disciform keratitis, and you can see over here, usually the central, but it's diffuse keratic precipitates as over here, a localized lesion with thinning and infiltrate around the periphery, and this antibody, antibody antigen immune complex deposition causing these Wesley rings uh, are also seen in zoster as they are in herpic, herpes simplex and also some other forms of uh, bacterial keratitis. They're not specific to virus. And interstitial keratitis, again, both in zoster and, and simplex, as you can see over here. The difference between disciform and um, uh, interstitial is that here there's a leash of blood vessels coming from the periphery with the infiltrate, and they can cause thinning. And all these are examples where there is stromal infiltrate with the leash of blood vessels. And here, possibility of an immune ring formation as well. One of the interesting things is that uh, in a study we did, uh, we looked at various causes of keratitis and found that the commonest cause of corneal vascularization was herpetic eye disease. And the commonest cause of lipid keratopathy was vascularization caused by herpetic eye disease. So vascularization caused by other causes does not tend to leak lipid as much as vessels caused by zoster or simplex keratitis, as you see over here. And that can become a problem um, if, if it involves the visual axis. You also get neurotrophic keratopathy. It's also called metaherpetic disease, where the disease is now not so much due to the virus infection, but due to the lack of nerves and the melting of the stroma because the trophic effect is gone. We, we know that the corneal nerves produce a lot of neuromediators, which support the health and nutrition of epithelium and keratocytes. And in turn, uh, we will we'll see this more when we talk about neurotrophic uh, keratopathy. So these kind of lesions are, are very difficult to treat because the, the stroma is melting 
uh, as a result of lack of nerves. Then the infection can come and go, just like we saw with the IgG, IgM antibodies as chronic relapsing disease in the body. It can also be chronic relapsing in the cornea, and you can get various manifestations due to that. And over time, with each flare-up, more and more inflammation and more vessels tend to grow, and eventually the cornea becomes totally vascularized. This can lead to melts and perforations, as we see here. And you can then get two other main causes of corneal in involvement. One is due to the lid disease that is caused, as you can see, a lot of scarring, distortion of the lid margins, and that will cause rubbing. And if there's keratinization, it'll cause a lot more disease. In a patient like this, where the lid closure is affected, you can get exposure changes. So corneal damage due to lid uh, uh, prop involvement is another kind of manifestation. And corneal damage due to conjunctival pathology is again another uh, set of manifestations. And you can see a lot of follicles or papillae or pseudomembranes. And when these happen, they also affect the, the cornea. So one has to bear in mind this complex pathology that is going on all simultaneously in these patients. Fortunately, the disease is almost always unilateral, which is a relief because uh, at least in, from the point of view of vision, the patient is not totally blinded. I'm not going detailed into the pathology other than to just show you some slides here where this is an experimental disease. You can see the actual iris is intensely inflamed, the ciliary body and the processes are all infiltrated. And this is how the vasculitis looks, intense infiltration of mononuclear cells along the blood vessels causing occlusion. And the same happens around nerves causing the neuropathy. So that's what happens in, in and this is in, in a rodent model. And in the transmission electron microscope, you can see in the retina, this is in the plane at the posterior part with the choroid and cells are actually migrating through pores in the Brooks membrane to come into subretinal space from the choroid. So a lot of inflammation going around all over the eye. How do we diagnose this? Primarily by the history and by the uh, clinical features, but one can take smears from the base of the vesicle and then look at it under the microscope to look for intranuclear, intranuclear eosinophilic inclusion bodies and for multinucleated giant cells. Treatment, again, acyclovir seems to be the mainstay of treatment of zoster. And uh, Dr. Syed has given you various dosage regimes. So the drugs are the same for zoster as we use for simplex with the caveat that topical uh, applications are less effective in zoster than in simplex. But there are, for each of these antiviral drugs, there are dosage regimes which are pretty high. So five times a day of 800 milligrams of uh, acyclovir uh, is, is what one would use to treat zoster. Uh, uh, you can give intravenously. And in patients who are immunosuppressed, the doses can be even higher. Um, the medical treatment, there are certain um, issues that if there is a resistance to a cyclovir, then you can use Foscarnet because the mechanism of action is slightly different. And it's important that treatment is started very early. If treatment is started within 72 hours of the rash, then the clinical manifestations and the neuralgia, which is the post-herpetic neuralgia, are less. So it's very, very important that uh, window of time. And, and you can see the studies have shown that there's improved cutaneous healing, reduced new lesion formation, reduced time to pustulation scabbing, therefore less time for infection to spread. And like I said, the reduced incidence of neuralgia. Uh, what do we use, when do we use, or should we use corticosteroids? And the answer is yes, in severe conditions, it would help uh, because otherwise the damage can be severe even when it's life-threatening. Systemic steroids can help with the extensive skin lesions and when sight is threatened due to orbital involvement, uh, when optic neuritis is there, nerve palsies are occurring and when the brain <clears throat> and the meninges are, are being affected, 
then steroids uh, come in very helpful, but they have to be used together with the um, corticist, uh, without, with the antiviral uh, treatment. In the point that topical uh, steroids will help, uh, but topical antiviral should be used, or at least systemic should be used, but uh, the topical are less effective. Uh, interestingly, if trabeculitis is the cause of the raised pressure, steroids actually help reduce the pressure in these cases. So one should not think about steroid response glaucoma if there is high pressure related to zoster, always worth a try because you reduce the inflammation, reduce the trabeculitis, and the pressure will come down. Uh, other options, there are various other treatments, you know, uh, which may be for complications that you anticipate, pressure control, lubricating drops. Nowadays, we have this recombinant nerve growth factor for neurotrophic keratitis, and as we discussed early, antibiotic treatment to prevent secondary infection. There are a whole range of uh, surgical treatments, and we'll finish in a couple of minutes with this. Um, if there's a non-healing ulcer, then you can give a botulinum toxin injection to drop the, the lid, and that helps the ulcer to heal. If there are melts, you can use amniotic membrane to repair those melts and build corneal tissue or heal non-healing defects. As you see over here, uh, this patient had this um, facet or the deep stromal melt, multiple layers of amniotic membrane, all sutures out, and you can see the depth is now much less than what it was to start with. Here's another example of this almost desmetocele appearance with multiple layers and the one on the top of amniotic membrane. Uh, conjunctival hooding is again a, a good option where there's a non-healing defect. And some of these images uh, kindly uh, borrowed from uh, Dr. Said's uh, cases. Um, Tarsorafi, again, for non with a gold standard, central or lateral. And then we have the vessels. If you're treating the vessels intraoperatively or preoperatively, uh, you do this fine needle diathermy occlusion where you insert a tenor monofilament nylon along the blood vessel and touch it with the tip of a monopolar quatri, and it helps to treat these uh, blood vessels and close them in preparation for surgery. And it's also uh, very useful in treating lipid keratopathy. So you can imagine zoster lipid keratopathy. This is the vessels have been closed by fine needle. Cattle trucking in the vessel means the circulation is stopped. And over time, you can see the lipid has started to clear and it'll, it'll completely resolve. And this, this technique is used very, very commonly now for treating lipid keratopathy. Another example, extensive vascularization, immediately after treatment, intracornal hemorrhage. But when that resolves, you can see all these vessels have gone by this technique. And then that can be used. Uh, now the eye is ready for a cornea transplant with less risk of rejection. Corneal gluing, if there is perforation, is helpful. All these are standard treatments across whatever may be the cause for these conditions, not necessarily zoster, and then sometimes therapeutic grafts. Now, finally, this is interesting. Because of the high risk of zoster and the damage it can do, even if it's not in the eye, it can be extremely painful. Uh, vaccines have been developed, and you have the Zostavac, which is a live vaccine, and is given as one dose, or the Shingrix, which is a non-live vaccine, and given as two doses, two months apart. And uh, they are available now on the NHS in the UK, but only for people over 70 years old. But it does reduce the occurrence of uh, uh, shingles, which is the Zoster disease, uh, whether it's in the skin or on the eye. And I think it's something which we will see more of um, as it does help uh, with the debilitating consequence of this condition. Thank you. Well, uh, we do have a question from Dr. Meena Lakhtipade. And she asks, how do you differentiate septicinous ulcer from sclerotis with PUK? So, um, is PUK is peripheral ulcerative keratitis, and peripheral ulcerative keratitis can be 
infectious or non-infectious. So a serpiginous ulcer is an infectious PUK. So that's a technical answer. But what you mean is how do you differentiate immune mediated from a infectious zoster related um, serpiginous ulcer in the periphery? So one of the things is go with the history, uh, look at corneal sensations. Uh, usually with simplex or zoster, they will be reduced compared to immune mediated PUK and do a scrape of the base of the ulcer. And if you look very carefully at the epithelial edge of the ulcer with fluorescein staining, you have a very fuzzy and a, um, a fimbriated edge, if you like. It's got uh, irregular, it's not a clean edge like you see with the PUK, which is due to an immune disease. And obviously, if you watch the patient over a day or two, you will see quite rapid progression of the epitheliopathy if there's active virus infection, but not so much with PUK. So uh, the definitive one would be if you can culture virus from the base of the ulcer. Thank you. Hello again. So my next talk will be on bacterial keratitis. So the WHO says that corneal scarring is the single most important cause of avoidable blindness. 5% of the world's 500 million blind can be due to corneal scarring uh, from infectious keratitis. Corneal blindness is the third most common cause of blindness. So that is why it is quite bad. Now, it's also bad because contact lens is on the rise and 50% of MKs are, uh, are seen to be contact lens wear. Uh, fungal keratitis is also on the rise. Acanthamoeba keratitis is also on the rise with the contact lens wear. And there is challenges in the diagnosis and there is also mixed infections. There are problems with emergence of resistance strains and there are problems that we are creating new surgical planes with our lamellar surgery. And uh, they are promising, but uh, non-specific therapeutic modalities for uh, different bugs. There is unavoidable scarring, which requires very further visual rehabilitation. So even after you treat the ulcer, then you get and end up with scarring and the patient is still blind. It's also bad because we get these virulent infections, such as pseudomonas, which can lead to a massive ulcer in a few hours. Mm -hmm. Or you can get sometimes a big mixed infections, like in these patients who had mixed bacterial and viral infection, and it becomes very difficult to know that it's a mixed infection because initially it shows a response, then there is stop of the response, or it just stops to getting better. You can also get infectious crystalline keratopathy. So this is a, a, a bacterial colonization in the absence of the host immune response and happens mostly after grafts when the nerves are cut or the cornea is neurotrophic or the patients use anesthetics or prolonged use of steroids. And you can see it appears like these uh, needle-like appearance in the cornea and in IVCM and even in histology. And these are very, very difficult to treat. And stepped variance is one of the most common causes of infectious crystalline keratopathy. You can get other types of atypical keratopathy, such as the mycobacteria. And this is quite common after laser refractic surgery. And it is responsive to clarithromycin or the nucardia, which appears like a wrath-like pattern, uh, a ring shaped, which can be responsive to amikacin. So these are quite atypical forms of uh, mycobacterium and uh, atyp causing atypical keratitis. Now, the keratitis can progress and cause melts and perforations, as you can see here, and you can still get also get scleral involvement or scleral abscess, like in this patient, a patient with pneumococcal infection, and, and you can see here you can get very extensive scleral as well as interstomal, uh, inter, interocular spread. It's also bad because these, you can get the interface infection from a suture. For example, if it's a loose, then the bacteria can find its way to the, in, uh, the area between your dalk or the desect, like in this patient who had a dalk infection, as well as in this patient who had a um, desect infection and presented with infection from the edge of the wound with hypopion. 
So all of this, then the, the bacteria finds its way through the, the plane that you've created with your surgery. And these patients finally healed with treatment. Uh, then after you've treated the patient, you end up with a skull and it can be a central skull uh, with thinning and vascularization. And again, the patient is uh, blind. So how do we treat bacterial keratitis? We've got to go back to the basic. So history, thorough clinical in, in examination, use your diagnostic task, go stepwise with your medical uh, therapy, and there's also surgical management, especially in acute cases or cases that are non-responding and in late cases for visual rehabilitation. So history, history of contact lens wear, very, very important. Uh, if, if you see any um, uh, areas of keratitis, you can see here, always ask about contact lens wear because uh, acanthamoeba, for example, can become very subtle with very minimal subepithelial infiltrate. And we always ask the juniors to call a more senior person if the patient is a contact lens wearer. Now ask about uh, organic uh, and metallic trauma. So that's also very important. And it's very important to make this thin beam to see if that uh, foreign body is intrastomal or actually on the cornea, like this patient who had a foreign body on the cornea and the patient was complaining for a long time and getting treated with antibiotic, but it was actually had to be just removed. Uh, ocular surface diseases are very important, and you, uh, especially ocular secretion pimphigoids can be very subtle and missed and can cause secondary bacterial infection. Uh, look at uh, as the history of cold sores, especially if you see dendrites or you see a corneal edema or non-healing ulcers. And don't forget the nasolacrimal obstruction. If you have got chronic conjunctivitis or conjunctivitis with keratitis, then don't forget to ask about any history of nasolacrimal obstruction. And also you will probably need to flush the sac. When you examine, you need to examine systematically. So the eyelids, the eyelashes, the sac, and then look at the conjunctiva, look for papillae, follicles, and ulcers, because you can see papillae here and follicles here, which can denote here a, a, a shield ulcer or here uh, adenoviral infections. So the conjunctival signs can give you an insight onto the reason for the corneal signs. Limbitis can be found in acanthamoeba and herpetic infections, and it can be an early or late sign in acanthamoeba, but remember it can also be found in herpes. But if you see keratoneuritis, that's pathognomonic of acanthamoeba. And again, you have to examine the corneal epithelium without and with fluorescein. And so you can see very subtle signs like this picture of an early acanthamoeba patient, uh, which can be stained here, and it looks very different then at the right, and you put the 2% fluorescein and ask the patient to blink and look and one and before the fluorescein seeps under. So I always tell uh, my uh, colleagues that if they want a second opinion, don't put the fluorescein because if you put it and leave the patient for a while, then it will seep under the epithelium uh, and, and it will change the picture if somebody else is coming and having to have a look. Now examine the corneal stoma once you're done with the epithelium, you check if there's amount of infiltrate and the amount of infiltrate and the ulcer may not go together hand in hand. Sometimes the ulcer starts to become smaller while the infiltrate is much more or the vice versa and look with a thin beam and see the amount of thinning that you've got. Uh, very important to check for leaks and remember if the AC is shallow and you might not find a leak even if there is a perforation because there is not that much aqueous. So in this patient, put a drop of fluorescein 2% or the fluorescein strips and do some pressure on the cornea um, to make see if there is any cedal positive and also check obviously the pressure because if the pressure is low, most likely you've got a leak. Then you go to the endothelium, examine for AKPs, look at the AC, look at the iris, and uh, also look if there are any plaques, because plaques are quite common with fungal infections, and obviously check the amount of hypopion. Very important to measure the intraocular pressure and the corneal sensation, especially uh, if you have if you're suspicious of mixed infection with both viral and bacterial. 
As I said before, in vivo confocal microscopy can be very helpful to diagnose acanthamoeba. So uh, you can see the cysts, bite spots, and double wall cysts here, and signet ring appearances. Uh, but if you, the acanthamoeba can be seen on the epithelium uh, normally, but if they are in clumps or they are more in the stroma, then that is much more suggestive of infection. Uh, you can, the IVCM can also help you to look for fungal hyphae, like you see here in aspergillus, which uh, it can be quite different from activated keratocytes. Uh, the OCT is also very helpful to, the, uh, to see the amount of thinning, the extent of infiltrate, and to follow up your patients, uh, and to follow, especially with deep abscess where you can't really decide how much of the infiltration and where it is. Uh, the OCT can be also very helpful in your decision to visually rehabilitate these patients, whether it is, a, uh, you can do a PTK if it's a very, very thin superficial car, scar, less than 50 microns, or if it's more than that, then the patient might require a dark, especially if it's a central also causing a scar. Yeah. Now, laboratory diagnosis is very important. So you take your swabs and scrapes and send them for gram stain and culture and even PCR, or you can do impression cytology. And if it's a resistant ulcer, you need to stop all treatment and biopsy. Uh, now, you do not, when you do your uh, swaps and scrapes. Remember to remove all the debris and all the uh, discharge because that will not have the microorganisms. And then make sure the plates are warmed to room temperature and take your swabs very firmly from the base and the edge of the ulcer without taking any discharge and put it in a C-shaped manner because then uh, the microbiologist can tell if uh, the growth is in within the C, then that's actual growth. But if it's outside, it's more like to be a contaminant. The PCR is very, very useful. It clones pieces of the DNA of the organisms. It is very sensitive, but you can get also false positive from airborne infections or contaminations from your technique, and it's also very expensive. Uh, it's very important wherever you are in the world to determine uh, the organisms that are most common in your area. For example, within this study in Nottingham, and we found that the staph aureus was a more common, the commonest, and uh, followed by the acanthamoeba, followed by the pseudomonas. This study was led by uh, uh, by Munir Autry, who was a PhD student at that time uh, in Nottingham. It's also important to determine what are your most common risk factors, and, and for us, it was ocular surface disease, followed by contact lens, followed by surgery, and to determine what really works for you. So in our, for us, it's standard to use intensive antibiotic of kefiroxin, 5 to 10% and gentamicin or amikacin fortified as a, uh, as a starting uh, combined in, in treatment for all our inpatients. And we did find that the outcome was actually similar uh, with, when the cornea scripts were positive or negative, uh, and that tells us that our um, specific technique of treating our cases in this part of the world works for us and helps us to resolve most of our infections. But we did a similar study in Egypt, and we found that the PCR was very high for bacterial and fungal. So there's a lot of fungal, about 43% of infection. Therefore, uh, we said we'll start our treatment always with vancomycin and, and ciftadizine, but we also have to add interconazole systemic for, to cover fungal infections for all of our infections because of the very high rate of fungal infection. So how do we make things better? Well, it depends if, it's the, uh, if the inf uh, ulcer is, or the infection is peripheral and non-site threatening, we go with monotherapy. But if it's a site threatening ulcer, you need to intensive fortified dual therapy to cover both gram positive and gram negative. So central site threatening ulcer, you use a combination of one of the aminoglycosides and one of the cephalosporins. And small peripheral ulcer, you can use one of the fluoroquinolones, whether it's second, third, or fourth generation. Obviously, the fourth generation is the most uh, effective. Don't forget that uh, systemic antibiotics are not normally used in corneal ulcers, but it will be uh, very useful if the sclera is threatened. 
you can use doxycycline if there is melt because it's a purchase inhibitor, it will reduce your melting. Use a mediatic atropinize the patient or use cyclopentolate 1% three times a day to prevent the pain and or use your anti-glaucoma uh, medication orally if the pressure is high because the patient is already on a lot of drops and don't forget your analgesics. In deep abscess like this, pseudomonas patient, the patient had a large ulcer with a very deep abscess and the patient kept on responding. And at a point, the patient stopped responding because the infection was very deep. Uh, and the ulcers, although much smaller, but the infection became uh, uh, much quite resistant because it was quite uh, posterior. And sometimes even the ulcer completely heals and you still have the deep infiltrate. And for these patients, you can inject intrastomal uh, injections, like in these patients, we've injected 0.4 milligrams and 0.1 mil of amikacins, repeated injections twice uh, weekly, and the patient eventually settled. Don't forget your old therapeutic modalities, such as povidone, iodine 5%, cautery, chlorhexidine, or silver nitrate, and some people use even thermal cautery when the, nothing else is working, or actually do a keratectomy. So the all therapeutic modalities can be available if nothing else is working. The antimicrobial peptides are the futures, and they are proteins with antimicrobial properties, and they are present in your new tears, or, or they are synthesized from your ocular surface, the beta defenses, or the neutrophils on the ocular surface. And people are trying to use the antimicrobial peptides and combine them with uh, antibiotics and antivirals uh, to improve uh, the susceptibility of our microbes, but unfortunately, it's still not yet available in the market. A lot of studies are going on, and the future will be in antimicrobial peptides. If the your signs are worsening, uh, of your symptoms, uh, then don't you can stop all treatment for 24 to 48 hours and do a deep corneal biopsy, like we did in this patient who had a graft infection, keeps getting better than worse. Then we made a corneal biopsy and taken the sample from the base of the biopsy because that was a lamellar graft, and we found uh, strict viridans, and this was a patient of infectious crystalline keratopathy. So uh, that is very important. If again, it's worsening after initial improvement, you have to consider that you might have another bug. So bacterial with viral, mixed bacterial, additional fungal or acanthamoeba, check with the drug sensitivity uh, with your lab and also look for drug toxicity. So ask the patient to look up and look down if you can see uh, uh, the difference in redness, so much more red down than up, then uh, this is a, li a likely sign of toxicity, especially if you put fluorescein and find conjunctival staining. This paper has been published by Professor Dua. And very important, and you know that at that point that you've got a lot of toxicity, you have to really reduce and cut down your drugs. The amicacin specifically and the gentamicin 45 are very are known to be very toxic and you can't give them in high concentration for a long time. Now, steroids can be used in specific situations, uh, such as in grafts, but not initial. You have to first see a response to your antimicrobials. So once you've got a response, then you can add a small dose of steroids. Um, and also in scleritis, you may need to give the steroids earlier uh, and you can sometimes need to give it systemically. Collagen cross-linking. Uh, the collagen cross-linking is quite useful because it releases free radicals and this uh, strengthens the bonds between the collagen fibers and reduces your melt. It also activates the oxygen species, which causes damage to the DNA and RNA of the virus, but it also causes uh, dose-dependent keratocrosite apoptosis. So we've done a study which uh, compared the cross-linking with your antimicrobials versus antimicrobials alone, and we didn't find much change in the time to healing. However, we found more complications with patients who had uh, antimicrobials without cross-linking. This is one of the patients who had multiple infections. Remember, if we do cross-linking, the hypopion is likely to increase before it uh, reduces again and uh, completely scars because 
the dead um, microbes are there and also the immune reaction and the neutrophils are coming. So they cause increase in hypopion and that's called a Herxheimer reaction. Uh, Viral infection uh, can happen uh, also post cross-linking uh, and bacterial infection can happen after, after cross-linking. So it's very important because you are creating a large ulcer. So remember that it can cause the activation of herpes. So it's not for herpetic infection and you can create an, uh, an, uh, an infection post uh, cross-linking because uh, of the large ulcer that you're creating. And that can actually lead to a large scar, as in this patient. Corneal gluing. So if you have got a CDL positive or shallow AC, uh, they're very important to glue the patient, especially if it's smaller than three millimeter. Uh, and this is an appearance of a normal amount of glue. Uh, but this is excessive glue, which will cause a lot of irritation, as you can see here. And the movement of the lids will dislodge the glue. We usually tend to put a contact lens on the eye. Um, and also, if you're going to do a therapeutic graft, you may glue the patient to form the globe before you do your graft, like in this patient. If you the iris is coming and it's a small part of iris, you can do a double drape technique where you put a small part of a drape to cover the iris and then put the larger part with the glue so that the glue is not in contact with the iris and causing a lot of irritation. And you can glue in, uh, on the slit lamp as well. The slit lamp gives you a very good view. And uh, in a busy clinic, that's also very possible. You can put a speculum or ask a colleague to hold the lids the holding the lids with the with the fingers actually cause less pressure on uh, the globe and then remove all the debris and put the glue. But you have to be very careful because you can put too much glue and then taking it out becomes much more difficult. Watch infections because with infections, you can also like very dense abscess like this. You can still get a, a perforation and that patient was glued. And if you glue and put a contact lens, then the infection can get worse. And in this patient, we had to actually take the contact lens off, even though the glue is there because the, then the infection became better because the penetration of the antibiotics was better. When do we take the glue off? When you start to see vascularization underneath and around the glue, usually around two months time. And when you take the glue off, you will find a small ulcer underneath because it prevents epithelialization, but that will heal quite quickly. As long as there is epithelium cover, then don't worry, even if you've got quite a lot of thinning. Remember, if you put a glue, you can get secondary bacterial infection, even secondary viral infection. So don't forget to keep examining the patients regularly because if you put a bandage contact lens, then the bacteria can flare up and sometimes even the viral can flare up. Uh, then if you have an infection with a lot of thinning like this and melting, treat the infection first. And once you end up with a clean ulcer like this neurotrophic ulcer, you can go at this point and put a multilayer amniotic membrane, which will help clear the ulcer. Remember that also your conjunctival hooding is a very, very useful uh, in cases, debilitated patients, in bed uh, bed uh, ridden patients like this patient, diabetic bedridden, uh, had the abscess, was not responding because of her diabetes. Then we went and put a conch hooding and in very uh, short time, she healed completely. So the conch hooding is very, very useful when um, you want a, a rapid response. If you have a large perforation, then you are, have to go and do a therapeutic graft like this patient with a uh, professor who has done a peripheral graft. Uh, he's done a peripheral gluing, which failed a few times, then ended up having to do a therapeutic graft. To make things uh, so, the, to, uh, to uh, sum up, uh, you need to have a systematic approach to your history and examination. You need to improve your diagnostic techniques and work very closely with your microbiologists. Uh, there are new frontiers. Look out for uh, new modalities of treatment. Collagen cross-linking uh, uh, needs more standardized protocols and no, needs more evidence that it's working. But certainly for bacterial keratitis, it does show quite a lot of evidence of uh, reducing the infiltrate and especially in more superficial infections, as well as uh, making your cornea stronger. So good is getting better, but we still have to work for the best. Thank you.
Uh, we got a couple of questions here. <clears throat> the first one is from Mr. Saka. Do we need to taper work on after two weeks in epithelial keratitis? Do we need to taper work on after two weeks in epithelial keratitis? So for epithelial keratitis, you can give treatment up to uh, three weeks. Tapering is not the condition for uh, uh, antiviral. So you can use it five times a day or you can use it three times a day. Depends really how extensive the, uh, the viral keratitis is. But I don't think you need to taper. So you can't use it like twice a day. Although some people use the Vergan long term uh, once a day. This is off label. If the systemic, they are intolerant to systemic antivirals, but that's not the gold standard. The gold standard, if you have to give uh, uh, prophylaxis treatment, you have to give it systemically. So I would just keep it five times a day uh, for two up to three weeks. After that, it becomes quite toxic. And if it's not responding, then think there might be something else or uh, you might uh, have to stop everything and swap or could do the bridement or, or try and uh, even do PCR to make sure that it's a viral infection. We've got one more question from an anonymous attendee. When is it not advisable to use opera steroids? When is it not advisable to use opera steroids? Well, it, we, it is not advisable to use ocular steroids in any contact lens patient if you're not 100% sure it's not acanthamoeba because we all, we in our eye casualty, which is a tertiary referral center, have stopped the use of any steroids in a patient with contact lens wear because of the amount of missed and misdiagnosed cases of acanthamoeba. And you'll see that in the coming talk about acanthamoeba, because if you give steroids, then the prognosis of the case becomes totally different. Now, uh, the other thing is we don't tend to give steroids before you see an actual response, quite a good response to anti your antimicrobial. Also, if you're suspicious of fungal, I would not give steroids at all early until the fungal infection is almost uh, almost healing, and I would only give it once a day or alternate days even. So for acanthamoeba fungal, I wouldn't want to give it uh, in contact lens where I'll be very, very careful not to give steroids. We don't tend to use steroids uh, often because we find also quite a bit of resistance and sometimes flare up when you give steroids. So that sort of brings us to the end of uh, session one this morning. We're going to take a quick break of 10 minutes and we're going to be back for like 10.35. In the meantime, I'll certainly appreciate it if you could just uh, fill in this evaluation form. There are two parts to it. So if you can do the part one now and the second part will be released at the end of uh, today's talk. So you can either scan the QR code on screen or you can copy paste the, uh, the link below in a browser and that should take to the evaluation. Hello again. So I'm going to give you this uh, talk now about acanthamoeba and fungal keratitis as a follow-up up from the previous talk. So first, acanthamoeba keratitis. So uh, amoeba uh, of the ocular uh, significance are quite variable. The most uh, common one is the acanthamoeba, especially Castellani and then uh, Colbertoni or polyphagia. So these are the ones that we can find. And uh, the acanthamoeba is a free living protozoa that looks like this. It lives in fresh water, sea water, tap water, pool, jacuzzi. So remember, it can be everywhere. And uh, the trophozoites is much bigger than the cysts. So about 15 to 45 micron. And these are uh, how the cyst looks on EM. Um, and the most single most significant risk factor for acanthamoeba keratitis is soft contact lens wear. Uh, so contact lens and cases, hygiene is very important. Homemade salines, acanthamoeba can live in that. And it can come as a concomitant infection with other bacteria uh, or viruses. Uh, the, uh, the importance is that the trophozoite actually feeds on the keratocytes and on the epithelial cells, and it, it can cause an intense immune response. And a very little uh, vascularization you'll see with cases with uh, is only acanthamoeba and not a different bug, uh, such as uh, concomitant bacterial or viral infection. 
The incidence of acanthamoeba keratitis is about 1.4 per million in the UK, and that comes goes up to 21 percent to 21 per million for patients who are contact lens wearers. So you can see how much the contact lens wear can increase acanthamoeba keratitis. It it's not always unilateral; it can be a bilateral disease for 7.5 percent of cases. And remember that it can also come in a non-contact lens wearer in 3 percent of cases. The patient presents with severe photophobia, pain, tearing, and often the pain is all the time. So example, the early uh, appearance is this epitheliopathy, so like sub-epithelial infiltrate, pseudodendrites, uh, and a lot of redness and irritation and ciliary congestion, a lot of pain and not much signs. As we can say, it can mimic viral infections. You can see this pseudodendrite, or it can appear like this geographical uh, uh, ulcer, but this patient actually had acanthamoeba keratitis, but that patient had steroids. So that's why the steroids can cause quite change in the picture and can make the prognosis much worse. If you see perineuritis, so Perineural cuffing and infiltrate that is pathognomonic to acanthamoeba. You're not going to see this in the first week. You're likely to see this later on at about three to four weeks stage. So here you can see that's the nerve and this is a fuzz or perineural infiltrate around the nerve. And here again, this is a very, very uh, good picture, courtesy of Professor Dua. And if you see that, that's pathognomonic. Now, the problem is it can also mimic uveitis because it can present with uveitis either as an immediate presentation, early presentation, or throughout the course of treatment. And you will see corneal edema cells. And in these patients, actually, you sometimes have to give steroids undercover you with your intensive anti acanthamoeba Limbitis can be seen in acanthamoeba and herpes, and you can see here the limbus is swollen. And when you put fluorescein, it, it will accentuate the swelling of the limbus. So that's also a very important sign, which can be early or can be later on. And then after one month, you can see this ring infiltrate, single or double uh, ring abscess, and then ulceration. It can extend to the sclera, causing scleritis, and it can cause cataract and glaucoma and iris atrophy. It can be very ugly. Uh, so these are examples where you can see that infiltrate and large ulcerations in a patient with uh, culture positive acanthamoeba. And you can focal is very useful, as we said multiple times. Uh, it can show the cysts, and uh, if the cysts are clumped together and more in the stoma, that is diagnostic. If you see very superficial and one or two here and there, that's not diagnostic. Uh, and then again, here the uh, early manifestations that you can see here, but you can see that confocal of that patient showing so much cysts. So although very little clinical signs, the confocal can be very useful. You can take swabs and you can actually take an epithelial biopsy, like in this patient, take a bit of the epithelium and send it for gum and gym staining. All culture are non-nutrient E. coli enriched because the acanthamoeba will feed on the E. coli and, and, and then they appear in the culture. PCR is very, very useful. And we find that you were able to introduce this in Nottingham uh, and, and it gave us much positive rates than the culture. Um, and finally, a corneal biopsy. If the patient is not responding, you want a diagnosis, stop everything and take a corneal biopsy. So how do we treat? We treat, they've got multiple drugs which we can be used in acanthamoeba. Propamidine, boline, which is available sometimes uh, uh, over the counter in some countries, pentamidine, hexamidine, neomycin and polymyxin. PHMB is very, very good. Chlorhexidine, uh, the azole groups, uh, very rarely we use steroids. Um, now, if you have an epithelial and stromal disease, we tend to go for the cationic antiseptic agents, PHMB, 0.02%, or chlorhexidine, also 0.02%. They are bacteria, uh, I mean, 
as well as cysticide. So they will kill both the tophozoid and the cyst. And the advantage is that you can use them at a much higher dose than the minimal cysticidal concentration. So either PHMB or chlorhexidine as your starting point. And usually we combine this with one of the aromatic diamidines, the popamidines or the proline. It's well tolerated, uh, but it can be epitheliotoxic and after a while, then patients can uh, complain from toxicity of the propamidine, and in some patients, we had to stop it. Now, uh, if you don't have this, then uh, imidazoles also can be useful, uh, but they are anti uh, maybe static, and they will not work as well uh, for the cysts. Uh, and also, you can use systemic ketoconazole or itraconazole in combination. Um, you can have an additive effect if the patient's not responding. You can have an additive effect between the chlorhexidine, propamidine, PHMB, neomycin. So you can use a combination of antibiotics uh, or antiemetics. Uh, PHMB and chlorhexidine together sometimes are, uh, show synergistic uh, effect. Now, if you have scleritis and uveitis, uh, uh, you have to medically treat. As for epithelial disease and stomal acanthamoeba, uh, you have to also think about uh, doing some uh, steroid, giving some systemic steroids or cyclosporin or tacrolimus and the recovery of your intensive anti amoebic therapy. So, just to show you what we usually do, so we usually give propamidine and pH. After we've done the scrapes, we do propamidine and PHMB hourly day and night for two days, then day only for five days, then uh, start to drop to two hourly for another three weeks. You can add uh, polyfax, polymyxin, four times a day, or neomycin, uh, four times a day ointment, if you're suspicious that uh, there is an additional bacterial infection. You continue until the clinical improvement, then you can reduce the grief frequency to four times a day and maintain at four times a day for up to two months minimum if you've caught the acanthamoeba early, but some patients will have up to six to seven, eight months and some will have more than a year of treatment. You can give non-steroidal anti-inflammatory for the pain. Steroids only if you, there is clinical improvement and you have to stop the steroids before stopping the anti-acanthamoeba. And the total duration can vary quite uh, differently depending on the response to treatment and how early you've caught it and whether the patient had steroids before uh, uh, diagnosis or not. So patients who are non-responsive to PHMB can respond to chlorhexidine. So think of switching and uh, treat the pressure because sometimes you get high pressure in these patients with uh, systemic acetazolamide better because the patient is already on a lot of topical medications. Uh, and later on, you can shift to topical medications when you reduce the anti acanthamoeba medications. Uh, so is there a role for surgery? Epithelial development taking, actually, if the disease is very early on, when you take your scrapes and remove the epithelium, that can be helpful. Sometimes you've got to go for a penetrating or lamellar graft. Uh, we try and avoid this as much as possible, uh, except if the disease is uncontrolled or if the patient is an absolute agony or severe pain or cannot tolerate the treatment, then you want to take the decision at that time. And you have to obviously include uh, all the area of infection and cover with anti acanthamoeba after. Um, and you have to take that decision early enough before it spreads and becomes uh, more spread to the periphery. Collagen cross-linking is not yet advisable in acanthamoeba keratitis. There is not enough evidence in the literature that it is helpful. So for acanthamoeba keratitis, you have to have a very high index of suspicion, especially in contact lens wearer, especially in soft contact lens wearer. If your pain disproportionate to the signs is also a very important uh, something to think about, but not necessarily in every patient. It's commonly misdiagnosed at HSV and, and iridocyclitis because it can present initially with a pseudodendrite or it can present with iridocyclitis. If you see keratoneuritis, that's pathognomonic and uh, treat early and avoid steroids. Now we go to fungal keratitis. 50% of culture positive infectious keratitis in developing countries 
it will have a fungal component, especially if there is a history of vegetable trauma, also contact lenses, a patient is immune compromised, they are in a hot climate, uh, and it usually presents with a slowly ring lingering infection, which responds a little bit if, to antibiotics if it's a mixed infection or does not respond at all. Remember to ask about the personal factors of the patient. For example, we had a patient with fungal infections, which we missed for a long time, but until we looked at the patient's uh, nails and we found this fungal infection in the nails. Then we added our antifungals because it was negative in our swabs and culture. Another patient also, which was missed for a long time, had a dog with a fungal infection and had bilateral fungal infection, which, uh, which was mixed with bacterial infection. And uh, we kept on treating the bacterial. We did not think of the fungal infection. So always think of the personal factors of that patient and uh, ask about different uh, circumstances. And then when you look at the infection, with fungal infection, you see this feathery edge, uh, which is quite common. You see this inverted hypopion, uh, which is also a sign of fungal infection. And then the hypopion can become massive, and with especially with an endothelial plaque, which can be seen very uh, easily with an OCT. And you can see that shield, and if you have that shield on top, then that really needs to be removed because the penetration of your antifungals will not work very well if you have that shield. Uh, you can see these satellite lesions. So satellite is a very, very uh, important point to raise your index of suspicion that there is a fungal element in your infection. It can extend to the sclera and can extend intraocularly. And if you have an intraocular fungal infection, the prognosis is very bad. Always remember the intraocular pressure and the corneal sensations when you're treating your patients. And uh, we take corneal smears, sent for gum, and there are many different uh, other uh, stains, silver, calcifer, white, um, and uh, potassium hydroxide wet mount, I found was very useful to diagnose filamentous fungi. They give you very quick diagnosis and you can culture uh, the fungi and the fungal culture usually takes more time. Uh, so sabaud dextrose is one of the very uh, commonly used one or blood agars, or you can put the swaps into enriched media and send it to the microbiology, depending on what protocol you agree with uh, your microbiologists. When the fungal infection is very deep, you really have to go in and take a deep fungal biopsy. It will flare up the infection a little bit, and uh, it will cause quite a lot of irregularities, but sometimes you need a diagnosis. Uh, the IVCM is very useful because it can show you fungal hyphae, which looks different than these activated keratocytes. So if you have an experienced technician or a doctor working with you, IVCM can give you a diagnosis. And we found the IVCM quite useful because it just gives you immediate diagnosis rather than waiting for the culture. We found splits between the DM and the uh, and predismus layer in fungal keratitis. And that was published actually uh, uh, by uh, some people uh, showing these in histopathology. And it's quite unique to fungal infection that the split between the predismus layer and doer's layer. How do we treat fungal keratitis? We treat, start with topical antifungal drops. So polines, amphotericin B or natamycin. Amphotericin B is quite effective against candida, while the natamycin, which is commercially available, is quite effective for superficial filamentous fungi. Azoles, such as voriconazoles, is very much broad spectrum antifungal, very effective against aspergillus. It can also be effective against candida. And now it is our first line of treatment, actually, uh, in Nottingham. There are other azoles, such as the etaconazole, myconazole, econazole, or even ketaconazole. And there are also the echinocardins, such as caspofungin, when a lot of other things are uh, not working. The uh, mycotic uh, ulcer treatment trial said that adjuvant oral uh, voriconazole uh, can be used 400 milligrams twice a day for a week, then 200 milligrams 
uh, twice a day for 20 days, but they didn't show much change in the rate of healing or best corrected visual acuity. And they did show also uh, quite uh, adverse effects to the voriconazole, especially liver uh, complications. However, quite a few studies in India where fungal infections is quite prevalent did show uh, an report improvement with oral voriconazole. Debridement is quite useful. It's in some patients like this with a shield, you want to debride that shield with a crescent blade and remove it. You will remove a lot of the fungal load and will improve the penetration of your antifungals. Uh, Paxi XL has been shown to be adjuvant in some cases, but um, mainly in superficial cases, but some reports in deep fungal infection that they were associated with high risks of perforation. So still controversial. Uh, I personally used it in quite a lot of patients uh, with a positive response in mixed infections. Like in these patients with mixed infections, as you can see, the hypopsia is massive with a plaque. And after the cross-linking, obviously, in the uh, with continuing antibacterial and antifungal, the hypopion started to become less and the patient eventually healed. What else can we do? Uh, we can give systemic treatment. We can do the vitamin. We can do Paxiax health. We can uh, use combination treatment, but we can also use intracorneal uh, in injections. This is a patient who was admi uh, admitted in hospital uh, quite recently and was treated by uh, very closely by our fellow Costa Sreles from Greece. And he was treated with voiconazole and a combined kef and amikacin. And the patient uh, started to get better. Uh, then he started to get worse again. And uh, we started regular interstomal injections of voiconazole. And the patient got better until he was discharged. And once he was discharged, he came back again with a flare up. Then he had regular uh, twice weekly injection again of voiconazole. And eventually he healed at day eight after regular injection. He's had probably more than 40 injections of voriconazole. Eventually, that patient had a penetrating catoplasty, and this is the patient pre-op and the patient after. So even very resistant infections, uh, you can persevere with, and usually they end up with healing. Also, that patient, the courtesy of Professor Mustafa Salah from uh, the Research Institute of Ophthalmology, uh, patients who had post-LASIK infection and got much worse at day 10, no improvement with antibiotics. They had to amputate the flap uh, uh, and then give um, sent for culture and found a very rare uh, fungus, yeast fungus, and then eventually responded to antifungal and collagen cross-linking. Excisional keratoplasty, uh, only uh, if you cannot control the infection, you have to try and leave two millimeters of clear margin. Don't forget any therapeutic or, uh, or uh, tectonic graft. You have to do a peripheral iridectomy because there's a lot of uh, inflammation which will block your pupil and can raise the pressure quite extensively if you don't have a peripheral iridotomy yeah. and continue with your voriconazole and make sure you get use interrupted suture because you're going to get quite a lot of vascularization. The take-home message, you've got to have a thorough history, including the personal history, um, if the ulcer stops improving or gets worse, think you might have a fungal element, investigate whether with your IVCM if you have it or send to a, a tertiary referral center where they have an IVCM and definitely culture or do a PCR and do not stop treatment early. For fungal infection, you'll have to carry on with treatment and I would always say it's about six weeks to three months until the fungal infection heals and you can use an armamentatum of treatment and modalities and avoid therapeutic graft whenever possible. Thank you for your attention. We got, we got a question here from again from anonymous attendee. For very poor ocular surface and central ulcer, when gentamicin is causing drug toxicity, pseudomonas sensitive with gentamicin, would it stop a change? Uh... The, you can one either you can so you can either use the non forty form of the gentamicin, or swap to amikacin. But also amikacin has a lot of toxicity. It's less than the gentamicin. Think about interstomal injection because if the topic is the patient cannot tolerate the drops, then the interstomal injection can be quite effective. Thank you.
Thank you. Hello again. Uh, we on the home stretch, more or less. Uh, we're going to now talk about peripheral ulcerative keratitis and predominantly the non infectious peripheral ulcerative keratitis. These are again my declarations of interest. So, what is the definition? A crescent shaped destructive inflammation of the juxta limbal corneal stroma. This is associated with epithelial defect, presence of stromal inflammatory cells and stromal degradation or melting. Um, so, and then you also have conjunctival, episcleral and scleral inflammation. So the term ulcerative keratitis tends to imply that there's an ulcer, hence you need to have an epithelial defect for it to be an ulcer. But it is not necessary. So you can get peripheral keratitis or the early stages before the ulceration occurs of the same disease process. Therefore, the term marginal keratitis or peripheral ulcerative keratitis or peripheral keratitis are sort of used interchangeably. <clears throat> the symptoms these patients will present with a pain discomfort, photophobia, visual distortion or visual loss, but pretty much these are the symptoms you get from any corneal pathology. Now, we divide PUK into three types. One is it is without any systemic disease and it is often an immune response to a local infection. We call this micro ulcerative marginal keratitis as you can see this in rosacea, of flictinulosis. The second one is the Morin's ulcer, also called as macro ulcerative. And the third is the one with systemic disease. And usually this is uh, autoimmune and macro ulcerative. Examples are rheumatoid arthritis, Wegener's, polyarthritis, nodosa. So if it is without systemic disease and it's not micro ulcerative, then it will be Morin. So Morin is often a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, here's the example of what we would call marginal keratitis. You have a hypersensitivity reaction to staphylococcus exotoxins, very common. It may be associated with staphylococcus blepharitis. It's unilateral, but it can come and go. So you will see there is a, a subepithelial infiltrate without an epithelial defect, and it is separated from the limbus by a clear zone. Now, when there is no epithelial defect, like I said, you can't call it ulcerative, but it is really the same thing. Later, you find that it will spread circumferentially, and as it spreads circumferentially, it can break down and start to stain, and the, this, the gap between the limbus and the infiltrate begins to be filled up, with infiltrate or what's called bridging blood vessels grow in, and that's the progression from there to there. And that's therefore PUK. Here are examples of other patients. As you can see, these are peripheral infiltrates with a clear area. And some of these are slightly elevated or flat, and you can see there's quite a bit of infiltrate, but there is no ulceration. And here's another example where there's an infiltrate with fuzzy edges at the limbus, and this one is ulcerated. This is the high power of that. And there's another one which has healed before it progressed because it was treated. But the obvious pathology here to note is that the patient has extensive blepharoconjunctivitis, a lot of myobomin gland inflammation, telangiectasia of the lid margins, and that blepharitis is contributing to this marginal keratitis. And you can see from these peripheral vessels in the cornea that the blepharoconjunctivitis is chronic. It's been going on for a while. So in these situations, the normal commensal flora of bacteria in the conjunctival sac tends to go up. You have a lot of bacteria that are proliferating and usually they do more so at night when the tear film 
uh, secretion is less, the temperature in the eye goes up when the lids are closed, and the patients wake up with saying the lids are stuck together, and you know that there is this element of blepharoconjunctivitis, and the toxins that accumulate by this overpopulated conjunctival sac uh, will then cause um, this kind of marginal keratitis. Some more examples of that, and in this, there's one area clearly ulcerated and some that are not. So you can see the point again that uh, these, there's a transition, there's a spectrum between this and this. And other examples of the same thing can be quite extensive, as you see in these patients, with a lot of conjunctival, conjunctival inflammation as well. So these are all examples of marginal keratitis, micro-ulcerative, the first category, and yet another case. That's a patient with rosacea. As you can see, one eye is affected. Uh, here's a patient with uh, ulcerative blepharitis, crusting uh, of the lids and discharge and matting of the lashes. And there's flictinulosis also, which is a hypersensitivity a reaction to staphylococcal toxins. And there it could be purely conjunctival or as it involves the cornea, then this leash of blood vessels follow it to cause an ulcer at the periphery. And that's called a fascicular ulcer, which means ulcer with the leash of blood vessels. So rosacea, we know the treatment, and often many of these will respond to tetracycline group of drugs, warm compressors, the usual lid hygiene measures. And uh, nowadays we have azithromycin, and that tends to be very useful, 1.5% twice a day for three days, and the cycle can be repeated every month. The azithromycin helps to reduce the bacterial flora. It's broad spectrum, but it also thins the secretions of the meibomian gland, so it helps with the blepharitis, and it also has a, a slight anti-protease effect. You can also use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and steroids, but avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like your acular or uh, similar eye drops, there are a variety of these in patients who have a chronic epitheliopathy because there the risk of melt is high. Morin's ulcer uh, is, a, like I said, the diagnosis of exclusion. It is chronic, it is painful, it is progressive. There is no underlying systemic disease previous trauma or surgery, none of that you see in these patients. And it progresses to start with circumferentially, but very rapidly starts to migrate centripetally as well towards the center of the cornea and leaves an overhanging inner stromal edge, and it can be bilateral. So there are two types, identified type one, which is a limited form, it occurs in older patients, usually unilateral, less symptomatic, and responds well to treatment. And completely opposite of that is type 2. It's in younger patients. It's much more progressive, much more symptomatic, very painful, can be bilateral often, and there's a poor response to treatment. And in some cases of Murren's ulcer, hepatitis C and helminthic infections have been found as associations. And um, it's been shown uh, in uh, research studies that the antigen calgranulin C is the one particularly against which the immune response is being mounted by the body. So here's an example of uh, peripheral ulcerative keratitis, first at the periphery, and then it progresses centrally. And one of the things I have noted, which has not been highlighted in any of the books, is the central cornea gets this whitish age. The cornea derived of the vessels and the nerves that are being destroyed in this ulcerative process is becoming necrotic. And what you see is that this appearance comes on very early on, either in the area where the ulcer is or all around if the ulcer is all around, and then that top bit all sloughs off. And what you're left with is a very thin, very heavily vascularized and often very dry surface of the remaining stromal bed. Uh, so here again, examples of Murren's ulcer, uh, melting, 
and it is differential some places deeper than others and this is circumferential migration but what you can see here now is circumferential and central so the central cornea is being melted and necro like i told you there's this whiteness along the edge which is that area is becoming necrotic and swollen as it's been completely derived of the uh, blood uh, of the blood supply these are uh, these blood vessels are not physiological so they are not serving the same purpose as the limbal plexus they are more inflammatory blood vessels rather than the normal blood vessels which are bringing nutrients to the cornea and remember the all and we'll talk this in the next lecture the nerves are entering the cornea at the limbus the main nerve trunks and they are also being destroyed and we don't talk about that but they are being destroyed therefore this cornea will be hypostatic and here again you can see 360 degrees very necrotic central cornea as the ulcer undermines the overhanging stroma hence it's uh, called the, the this typical appearance of an overhanging ledge to the ulcer is a, a classic of moran's ulcer but also of a systemic disease associated puk the treatment of uh, a moran's ulcer is again um, using immunosuppressive agents now want systemic corticosteroids are the most potent of the immunosuppressive agents and they're very useful in immediate effect to get an immediate response but because of the long-term complications you then switch over from steroids after inducing a remission to things like methotrexate azathioprine cyclosporine tacrolimus cyclophos there's a whole host of them but now there's the uh, the biologicals are really coming to the fore and anti tnf alpha antibodies are uh, very good because they <clears throat> will suppress inflammation both systemically and in the eye now which of these would you want to use it's a matter of choice certain drugs you will not use together for example cyclosporine and tacrolimus the same mechanism of action you would use one or the other uh, your immunologist who will help with the treatment of the patient uh, will give you an idea of which drug he or she is most comfortable with and uh, used uh, that drug often in the management of other immune diseases so they will use that drug and you could use methotrexic or azathioprine so there's uh, often not much uh, between one or the other and they're not specific for certain conditions we'll come back to that point uh, when we talk about those associated with systemic disease conjunctival recession or resection uh, most often resection is a good uh, option surgically because all the pro the polymorphs that are accumulating at the periphery in the conjunctiva and uh, releasing the proteases that are causing the digestion of the stroma um, are, are, are taken away so you're physically removing it you're not treating the underlying cause but you're preventing the sequelae or you're preventing the damage uh, tectonic grafting at the periphery gluing like you've done over here for the perforation amniotic membrane transplantation and amniotic membrane transplantation not just putting a patch one can make a roll of the amniotic membrane like a sausage and put it there and stitch it with overlying um, mattress sutures to fill that peripheral gutter and then allow cells to to grow into it and, and on top of it now PUK associated with systemic disease is a completely different ball game uh, for this reason it is an indication that the patient may have a life-threatening underlying condition and usually it is due to inflammation of the blood vessels which can cause strokes and cause heart attacks and cause uh, death because of the uh, ischemia and the acute rapid um, blood supply loss it can cause to organ systems and even the kidney and liver elsewhere and it may be the first sign of a necrotizing systemic vasculitis as in Wegener's granulomatosis so as ophthalmologists there are not many occasions where we 
save the patient's life. We, the, there are many, many occasions where we make life worth living by preserving sight, but you actually have an opportunity to save the patient's life. And PUK is one of them where a, a good examination will help you uh, treat. And this has happened several times with me when we were the first ones to diagnose the underlying condition because the patient's first manifestation was in the eye. And you have to have a panel of tests you're going to do. So a full history is very important. And often you will find, at least in my experience, I picked up the systemic diseases by asking the patient about a rash on their legs or any lesions like erythema nodosum on the body elsewhere about how they were generally feeling. They come to an eye doctor and they don't want to lift their legs up and the, the trousers up and show you lesions on the leg because they think it's not related, but it is. So if you proactively ask them, they will then volunteer, volunteer all the symptoms and signs. And we tend to do tests like the erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein. These are non-specific signs of systemic inflammatory activity, but they are good uh, indicators. You do a whole lot of autoantibodies. You can do anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-rho, anti-large rheumatoid factor, and the anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody, which is for the uh, um, Wegener's granulomatosis. Now, and this very important point this slide makes that the patient on the left has a chronic but asymptomatic peripheral ulcerative keratitis. The patient on the right has a very symptomatic uh, and very um, obvious prominent clinical signs of injection, but they're both equally dangerous. The silent form and this very aggressive form or apparently looking aggressive form can both be just as lethal if it is not treated aggressively. So you will not treat this one, uh, doesn't need much treatment is settled, and this one needs a lot, no. These and these both will need the same kind of intensity of systemic immunosuppression if they are progressive. And that is very important to note that those with inflammation and those without inflammation, particularly the latter can be just as lethal. So here are, some more examples uh, where you, the proper ulcerative lesions are seen and the bridging vessels are coming and then it starts to get deeper and deeper and then progressive and that intense conjunctival injection tells you that that's where the inflammatory cells are coming from. Now, this is Foster's uh, paper where, uh, I think that will come later, but this is interesting. His paper was also on rheumatoid arthritis in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, it occurs late in the course of the disease when joint activity has burnt out. We know that there are these atavistic antigens. So your sclera and cornea have cartilage-related proteins. And when the immune cells have access to the cartilage in the joints, they will attack the joints. It's much easier for them to get there. But once all of that is destroyed and the joints are burnt out, usually then the extra articular manifestation of rheumatoid start to come. Not necessarily in that sequence. It can sometimes be simultaneous, sometimes be before, but that's usually when it starts to manifest. And then you send the patient to the rheumatologist and they say, oh, the joints are all quiet. Nothing can't be rheumatoid. And we say, no, it is because it is now affecting the eye when these immune cells are still in the body and they're now looking at these cartilage antigens in the sclera and the cornea. Uh, it, it, and, and the similarity of the collagen, like I said, between that. And what Foster's paper was, which is very important, that rheumatoid arthritis patients with PUK die within five years if untreated. So very high mod, even in something like rheumatoid, you may think, oh, it's quiet and they don't need to be treated. So, and we find this very often, we have to push our rheumatologists to treat them because they say the joints are inactive, we don't want to treat them. And sometimes we take on the treatment because of the resistance we get from our colleagues. And the things to do is to monitor their CRP and ESR. If these 
biomarkers are high in the blood, you know it's active disease and you want to treat the patient aggressively to bring that down. Wegner's is quite a destructive um, condition in, in the eye, of course, when it gets to the eye, but in the lungs also. And here's where you have to do chest x-rays and CT scans. And it is the only uh, condition where one, and I was mentioning that earlier, would look at a specific immunological or immunosuppressive agent where cyclophosphamide seems to work better than anything else. Otherwise, uh, you don't have a specific methotrexate for rheumatoid and azathioprine for rheumatoid and not for Wegener's. You can use them, like I said, according to the convenience and experience of the immunologist you're working with or your own experience. But for Wegener's, it is um, um, uh, the um, cyclophosphamide, which is more important. And uh, in these conditions, particularly Wegener's, the sclera is also involved. So that's another distinction between Morin's ulcer, which is due to no known systemic association and the systemic associated conditions, especially Wegener's, where sclera melting also occurs. So the severity of peripheral ulcerative keratitis relates to the amount of conjunctival inflammation, corneal thinning, and hyperemia. So you start with infiltration inside the limbus, like we've seen before, formation of this gutter and ulcer, which starts to migrate circumferentially. Then there's considerable thinning, and that can lead to perforation. The conjunctiva on the other side of the limbus becomes thickened and elevated and rolled up. And sometimes it can also cause dalin formation further around the circumference. So, but it wouldn't be, would be difficult to tell that apart from the ulcer progression an initial absence of vascularization, then extensive superficial and deep vascularization. So that is the course of progression of these uh, ulcerative keratitis at the periphery. So here's another classic example of the overhanging edge that you see with thinning of the sclera, and eventually various kinds of perforations to occur. Very rarely, and this has happened, as in this case, you get super added bacterial infection and then the picture is confused so you may think this is an abscess which is rightly so treat it as an abscess but once it is controlled and settled then the underlying puk becomes obvious you do and you find the patient maybe also has rheumatoid so then you treat this like you would treat the puk but the first of course approach would be to get rid of the infection as quickly as possible uh, this one I showed you earlier, sometimes there can be a uh, masquerade lesion, but it is PUK, but only it's not due to immune disease, it is due to infection. And this was the herpes-related uh, infection along the periphery, serpiginous ulcer, all the other features of a PUK and the staining, as you can see, the edges. This is a bit late. If you leave the stain for too long, it goes underneath the loose epithelium and the edges become fuzzy, but otherwise you will see that little uh, ragged kind of a edge it has to the ulcer margin. And melts, of course, can again uh, mimic uh, a PUK. It, it is by definition, it's peripheral, it's ulcerative and so on, but it's infectious cause, not immune cause. How do we treat these? Again, there's a whole, the same lot of treatments. So you're trying to prevent the infection or treat one if it's there going to suppress the inflammation with steroids and immunosuppressants. You're trying to prevent the melting by using antiproteases, which is usually the tetracycline group of drugs, and you're trying to lubricate the eye. And so here you have in the topical range, we do have nowadays a lot of topical cyclosporin. There is a topical uh, skin ointment called protopic, which we tend to use, and you can apply that to the lids or the lid margin. It's not licensed for use on the in the eye, but if it, a bit goes in in the eye, it's still okay. It comes in 0.03% and 0.1%, the skin ointment. But even if you apply it to the skin of the lids, uh, it, it gets to the surface of the eye and is useful. And then of course, there are those other interventions like the glue, uh, we've talked about excising the conjunctiva, amniotic membrane grafts and corneal grafts. 
there are many, many uh, drugs. Again, the same drugs we've listed. And now you have uh, this anti-TNF-alpha, which is infliximab, and other biologicals specifically targeting the mononuclear immune cells. Uh, so how do we know that the treatment is working? There's epithelialization of the cornea in the region of the ulcer. There's a formation of a superficial layer of fibrotic material between the uh, beneath the epithelium, so that's subepithelial fibrosis. The vascularization start to regress. The vessels don't go back to the limbus; they just become less red. They become ghost vessels. The conjunctival thickening flattens, and the redness resolves. So that you will know is that uh, a sign that all when this is happening sequentially, that your treatment is working. The one thing you're left with is a very thin cornea, and You'll find this very often. The periphery is very thin, but it is epithelialized. Once it's epithelialized and there is no inflammation, the risk of perforation is very low. So that's one point I have observed, and I make it quite often. The other point I have observed, which is again very interesting, is no matter how much the peripheral thinning, as you see over here, the vision remains particularly good. There is not that much of irregular astigmatism. So if the thinning comes centrally, then the astigmatism become manifest. But if it stays along the peripheral one to one and a half millimeters of the circumference, the central cornea still remains stable. And when these patients get a cataract, you have to do a sclerocorneal incision so that your entry into the anterior chamber is as far peripheral as possible rather than from a corneal incision where it will become quite unstable, the wound during cataract surgery and afterwards. But you can do successful cataract surgery by just approaching uh, through the sclera rather than directly through the cornea. What I'm not sure about is whether the intraocular pressure measurements are accurate or not. You can imagine extremely thin cornea over here and you're trying to flatten the center and some of the pressure will be taken by the thin cornea. Will you get an accurate reading or not? Um, I don't know, but I suspect not. So in summary, PUK can have varied clinical presentation. Infiltrate with intact overlying epithelium can be as sinister as an ulcerative lesion. Stromal ulceration is the hallmark of the disease. It is site-threatening and life-threatening. Clinical features overlap and etiological diagnosis is not possible. So you cannot tell, oh, this is rheumatoid or this is polyarthritis by just looking at the eye. You have to do the requisite investigations. Uh, thin areas of intact epithelium are less likely to perforate compared to areas where the epithelium has been lost and the IOP measurement uh, question mark. Thank you. So, me again, uh, last talk uh, would be um, the end of a marathon session for many of you. Uh, we're going to look at corneal nerves and neurotrophic keratitis. You could have also called this corneal nerves the forgotten factor in corneal disease. And that will become apparent to you as we go through this talk. Um, So the corneal nerves, as we've already mentioned earlier on, uh, all of them come from the first division of the fifth cranial nerve, which is the ophthalmic branch. It comes from the uh, trigeminal ganglion and gives rise to the frontal nerve. And you have the lacrimal nerve and the nasociliary nerve. The nasociliary nerves pass through the ciliary ganglion without a synapse, only the parasympathetic fiber synapse, and come out as the uh, short ciliary nerves, which go to supply mostly the choroid. But the long ciliary nerves, which you have two of, uh, with the three and nine o'clock position, they travel in the suprachoroidal space, anteriorly reach the limbus, and then divide into branches, which encase the globe 360 degrees, at the limbus. Then they enter the limbus as one or two trunks, 
But if it's one trunk, it immediately divides into two. And this is demonstration of the nerves by a technique called acetylcholinesterase staining. Acetylcholinesterase remains in the nerves even post-mortem for several days. And if you use a proper substrate, uh, you can stain these nerves brown by this technique. And you'll see many pictures of that. So all these nerves are appearing brown. So these are the major trunks of the nerves. They then pass from the limbus uh, towards the center in the stroma moving anteriorly to emerge through the Bowman's membrane. And when they emerge through the Bowman's layer, they actually end suddenly in a bulb-like structure from which these fine subbasal neurites arise. And as you can see over here, this stromal nerve piercing Bowman's at four or five points, and each of those bulb-like structures then uh, represents the origin of the fine neurites, these are nerves without the sheet that then form the subbasal plexus. And if you look at the subbasal plexus, you find from there, vertical nerves will go intraepithelially uh, and to the surface, and they then terminate within the epithelium or in between the epithelial cells. And that is where it finally ends in these free nerve endings, which are very, very sensitive. The cornea is 40 times more sensitive than the dental pulp, 100 times more than the conjunctiva, and 400 times more than the skin. So excruciatively painful if it is touched because it is the most sensitive structure in the body. Now, the nerves serve a function, uh, and these functions are twofold, sensory and trophic. So corneal nerves do two things in terms of the sensory function. They are obviously afferent nerves carrying sensations from the cornea to the brain. Uh, they will promote the blink reflex so as something comes near the eye or touches the cornea immediately, the eye blinks, and that is the orbicularis ocular muscle coming into play to protect the cornea. These nerves also stimulate reflex tearing, and the tears then have some uh, growth factors and also physically wash out noxious stimuli. And these growth factors are advantageous to the epithelium. So protection, and secretion of tears. The nerves also release a lot of neuromediators, which are very essential for the health and uh, ability to divide and proliferate of the epithelial cells and the keratocytes. The epithelial cells in turn produce neurotrophins and neuropeptides and growth factors, which help the nerves and maintain nerve health and nerve regeneration. So you can see this very complex, mutually beneficial relationship between nerves and the ocular surface. This function of supporting the health and nutrition of cells and nerves is called the trophic function. And it can be interrupted in various stages and when it is interrupted or damaged, then disease occurs. Now, the cornea is avascular, but any tissue will need vessels to mount a defense response. And this is a very, very rapid defense response due to a local axonal reflex. When the cornea is insulted with any kind of uh, foreign body or microbe, there's intense circumcorneal injection because most of these nerves uh, or a large proportion of the nerves from the long ciliary, long posterior ciliary nerves that end at the limbus are vasomotor. Those that go into the cornea, then the sensory one, but the vasomotor nerves are the ones that cause in immediate dilation of the blood vessels. When these blood vessels dilate, and we know that circumcorneal injection is a classic sign of corneal pathology, it allows extravasation of inflammatory cells into the cornea, 
which then come into this avascular structure to fight disease. Now, when corneal nerves are not there or when they are damaged, then the host response doesn't occur because these local axon reflexes don't work. There's no ciliary injection and bacteria grow in the stroma of the nerve as they naturally would. And because their morphology is not altered by the host inflammatory response, you see this classic Christmas tree pattern of infectious crystalline keratopathy that Dr. Syed showed you in her talk as well. So this is the bacterial colonization or growth in the corneal stroma in the absence of the host response. And the host response is absent because there are no nerves. Or in cases where you're treating extensively with steroid medication, you will also see the same thing. But that is just to emphasize how important the nerves are in the host defense response. When you look at the cornea on the slit lamp, you see these nerves coming in, but you only see them for a short distance. And these nerves that are coming in are the trunks of the corneal nerves, which are myelinated. They, as soon as they lose their myelin, they become invisible and transparent as they should, because the cornea has to be transparent. If you do a section of the, the, this by, by the slit lamp, an optical section, you can see the point at which the nerves are there in the depth, usually mid stroma or between the posterior one third and anterior two thirds of the stroma. So that's the level at which they enter and then they make their way forward to pierce Bowman's like I've showed you in the previous images. On confocal microscopy, <clears throat> this is how you see the limbal nerve is very thick. As it is entering the stroma, it is becoming thinner and thinner to the surface finally pierces the, the Bowman's and the subepithelial interconnecting network of the basal nerves uh, is uh, formed from which vertical fibers go into the epithelium. And this is how the nerves would look on in vivo confocal microscopy. Now, unlike in the past, when it was said that the 12 and six o'clock positions of the eye <coughs> are watershed zones because the nerves are like this, therefore the long ciliary nerve nasally, temporally, there are no nerve stop and below, that's incorrect. We find that the nerves go all the way around and each quadrant will have about 11 nerves. So you can see the about 44 major trunks like these. This is again, the acetylcholinesterase straining I showed you before of nerves entering the limbus as they supply the whole cornea. And when they move into the cornea, you can see these nerves now in the stroma so clearly, most of them penetrate the Bowman's layer in the mid periphery, very few in the center. So about 125 penetrating or perforating, each dot represents one perforation uh, of these nerves. This is in a sclerocorneal disc that was removed at penetrating keratoplasty, hence it's not the whole cornea, but you can see the central perforation points are few. And again, uh, to just show you with the acetylcholinesterase staining, the subbasal plexus of interconnective nerves, the subbowman's nerve, that little bulb like structure. Here you see two bulb like structure with the neurites. And I showed you this before with multiple neurites. Now, on confocal microscopy, previously these bulb like structures were not mentioned uh, because the eye has saccadic movements and uh, they were, dis they were uh, thought to be or dismissed as being keratocytes. But if this video works, which it should, you will see how exactly this structure can be seen in confocal microscopy as well. And you will see this exactly that from which the neurites are coming and then it disappears and it looks like keratocytes. And that's why it was not picked up early. And these were on cadaver eyes where the eyes are dead still, they're not moving and you could see these. But now that we know it, we can see it more often because we know what to look for. And again, uh, this has been something uh, which was uh, shown by uh, Dr. McGee and others that these subbasal epithelial nerves do not form a random plexus, but they all converge. So the nerves from the top converge down here, the lower nerves converge, and they form a whirl pattern 
on the surface of the cornea and that epicenter of the world whirl is between the junction of the upper two thirds with the lower one third and this is on confocal imaging and a montage being created but we showed the same you can see from the bulb when the nerves are coming they're all converging to the point to form a whirl much like this whirl seen on confocal microscopy you can see it with the acetylcholine straining the staining as well and that is interesting because there are many corneal epitheliopathies where we use the term vortex keratopathy or hurricane keratitis. And hurricane keratitis is this world pattern seen on the surface of the cornea where the epithelial cell turnover is increased. The epithelial cells don't have time to settle and uh, they, the desmosomes are not formed. So the, the fluorescein will stain the outline of the uh, gap between the cells. And it's interesting that uh, the nerves form a whirl pattern and the epithelial forms of a whirl pattern and the nerves we know are actually vertically going into the epithelium. So anything that makes a whirl of the epithelium will twist the nerves accordingly. And whether it is the epithelial migration that is causing the nerves to take that configuration or the latter causing the former to take that configuration, or they're both response to ocular electromagnetic fields, which we think is the case because we've shown that in some experimental studies, you can form these world patterns and culture where there are no nerves, but the epithelial will form the worlds if grown in electromagnetic fields. The morphology and the pathology, this is a good transition slide. This patient had band keratopathy in one eye, and this pattern, which was diagnosed as lattice dystrophy, and the patient referred to me, but what you can see, these are calcified nerve sheets. Now, we know that the when the nerves calcify, it is the sheets that calcify, not the axons. And then after the point of those bulbs, the sheet stops there, and the bulb actually is formed by a fold of the sheet. And the neurites emerge, which are not only, uh, they're non-myelinated up to here as well, but they are not only non-myelinated, but they have no sheet. So the calcification doesn't extend beyond that. And, and even in an optic nerve calcification, very well described, it is the sheet that calcifies. So you can see these bulb-like structures and the nerves uh, because they have sheets to that point. And this was just calcification of the nerves. So in summary, the two long posterior ciliary nerves enter the limbus as 11 per quadrant. This is a summary of not my talk, but of the, the first part of the talk. Uh, the sub Bowman's area, they penetrate uh, the Bowman's at 125 points in the mid periphery to end in the bulbs. And they can be one to six terminal bulbs per axon or per nerve. And they're, they're tubular structures. They're rich in acetylcholinesterase, these bulbs, and they sometimes are associated with specialized epithelial cells. And then they form this interconnecting network of subbasal plexus from which the terminal nerve endings enter the nerve, uh, enter the epithelium and end intra or inter epithelially. So that's the normal architecture. Now let's look at what happens in diseases. And this is why I said it's the forgotten factor in eye disease. This is a patient or these are patients of bullous keratopathy that we studied, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. We don't see the nerves. We never talk about them. Nobody writes about them. But when they come to penetrating keratoplasty, as we did in some of them in those days, and you do whole mount staining of the cornea with acetylcholine stress, this is what you see. Confocal, there are thickening and excrescences of the nerves, as you see that in, in this acetylcholine straining. These nerves, which you don't even see so clearly on confocal in this image, that Y-shaped thickening here, and that intense, exuberant, hyper-regeneration of nerves, those excrescences over there, again, representing increased regeneration of the nerves, forming these coils and loops in the stroma, which you never see in the normal cornea. They are radially located nerves with dichotomous branching. You don't see these um, co coils and loops. And here in confocal also, you can see. So extensive 
corneal nerve pathology in bullous keratopathy. Patients with failed corneal grafts, there are two problems here. One is the edema like in bullous keratopathy, but also the nerves had all been cut to start with in the penetrating operation. So there were no nerves from where new ones would grow. And you can see because there are no stromal nerves, the subbasal nerves are coming from the host subbasal nerve, the rim, and they are then growing directly into the epithelium. Very, and here again, you can see these graft subbasal nerves, the graft host junction and the host rim, and they're going straight in rather than coming through a stromal nerve, which is coming through Bowman's and then coming out from there, which you see occasionally, but not often. And this is the extremes of innervation in corneal grafts. Here, there's absolutely no nerve, and this graft had failed, and we had to do it again. You can see some nerves are there up to the graft host junction. And this is another one which also had failed, but at some places, we're seeing that exuberant, coiling, looping, tortuosity of nerves. At other places, very sparse nerves, and other places, more like the normal straight lines that you see. So a huge variation in the pathology in the nerves that occurs as part of the healing process in corneal crafts. And we also see these growth cones. And sometimes growth cones can be excruciatingly tender uh, in other parts of the body, like in, in the um, amputation stumps. And here's one sub, uh, sub uh, sorry, here's one stromal nerve that has come up to the um, sub-basal Bowman's and then pierced to form those uh, neurites coming out from it in a graft situation. What about keratoconus? Now you think it's a very quiet sort of non-inflammatory disease. And this is advanced keratoconus where penetrating graft was done. And you can see depending on the severity of the cone, you see abnormality in the nerves. And here's this blunt loops, which you never see normally, but most of the pathology, almost all of it is in the region of the cone. So this is in mild uh, keratoconus. This is in more severe keratoconus. Notice the extensive thickening of nerves. Very, very thick nerves you see in keratoconus. And here's again, these branches are tortuosity looping, very thick nerves in these patients, but they don't have edema, they have thinning of the cornea. And when it is advanced keratoconus, this is what you see. And this is a very, very startling image, like a bag of worms in the cone. The periphery is relatively normal, though they are thickened. But in the center, this exuberant growth, and you can see compared to the normal thickness, how thick these nerves are in of the cone. You don't see this ever in a normal eye. You will see that internet uh, uh, interconnecting network. Here you see this circumferential distribution of subbasal nerves. Quite fascinating how the nerves remodel according to the pathology. Laser surgery, we do so much of laser surgery and we say we're leaving behind a normal cornea. We've got another thing coming because not always, particularly in patients who've got surface pathology, uh, like dry eye and all, they get what we call this ocular surface syndrome, central punctate keratitis. And you see the central punctate, coarse punctate keratitis, following LASIK surgery. And we had only one occasion where we got both eyes from the states of a patient who had LASIK in the past. And we could show these corneal nerve abnormalities. You can see uh, in, the, in the junction of the flap with the rest of the bud, so uh, bed here. So the nerves never go back to normal in many places in these eyes that have had LASIK where the nerves are cut. And here again, very fine, subtle central SPK in patients with dry eye symptoms, unlike the lower third punctate keratitis that you see in patients with uh, typical dry eye. These are central SPK. Then there's another thing interesting about nerves is this dissociation between the sensory and trophic function. And this is quite important clinically. So you can imagine this is the cornea and these are the nerves that are getting to the cornea. Trigeminal ganglion, this is a unipolar ganglion. So the nerves come into the ganglion as neuron and then go like that without synapsing and they go to the brain. So if you have a partial lesion of the ganglion or a complete lesion of the preganglionic fibers, 
these are ones between the brain, the sensory cortex and the ganglion, then the patient will have no sensations because the impulse is not going to the brain. But the cornea, though anesthetic on, on testing the sensation, will have only mild SPK, it will not break down. But if you have a complete lesion of the ganglion or a post-ganglionic disruption, then nothing is going up, there'll be no sensation, and the cornea will also have epithelial defect. And the reason is that the neurotrophic factors from the neurons over here are still going to the cornea and keeping the health of the epithelial cells in this situation, but in this situation, they are not getting there and the sensation are not getting up. So anesthesia with epithelial defects means it's a lesion over here and anesthesia with no epithelial defects means the lesion over there. But how can you tell them apart? The way you tell them apart also is by doing confocal. You'll find that the subbasal plexus will be actually normal in both the eyes where one has no sensation, yet the subbasal plexus is intact. And how can that be? Because the lesion is after the ganglion and the ganglion will maintain those axons that are supplying the cornea. And you can tell that quite easily. So that in these patients who've had neurosurgery and have lost the sensation, a confocal microscopic uh, image will help tell the prognosis. If there are no subbasal nerves at all, and it's hypostatic, then you know the prognosis is bad and you need to take measures. Otherwise, the patient will get um, um, ulceration. Uh, but if the subbasal plex is intact, then the risk is low. So moving on more with this pathology, you, you have this classic, everybody knows this pain with stain, a lot of punctate keratitis and erosion and staining, the patient has symptoms. That is dry eye, you can say with pain with stain or that condition. Then you have stain without pain. So a lot of staining, but the patient is completely asymptomatic. Actually, the disease is worse. The patient thinks it's getting better. This may progress to that, or it may come straight manifesting like that because the nerves are getting so destroyed that there is no pain anymore. And the patient thinks it's better, but the stroma is melting because of the loss of trophic function. And then this is the worst one where you have pain without stain. Looking at the eye, everything looks perfectly normal. Looking at the eye, there is no sign at all, but the patient has excruciating pain. And this group is the one where they are even suicidal. And we've got at least a dozen patients like these who are trying to help, but it's extremely difficult to treat. There are certain terms that we use. Allodynia means pain due to non-noxious stimuli. So it means in the normal patient, they mean this stimuli will not cause pain, like a little bit of cold air going across the eye, but in, in some patients cause a lot of pain. Photoallodynia means pain due to light stimulation. You know, we call this photophobia, but it's not just sensitivity, but actual pain. Then the term hyperalgesia and hyperesthesia. So enhanced pain response with infrathreshold stimuli. So a very, very light stimuli and the pain gets big pain response. That's hyperalgesia and hyperesthesia is where enhanced sensation with normal stimulus. So one person should behave X response to that stimuli, but the other one is much more. So that is hyperesthesia. So these are the, some of the terms we use and clinically to describe some of these conditions, corneal neuralgia, keratinal neuralgia, et cetera, are used interchangeably. And then there are two types of pain, uh, which is important to know. One is nociceptive pain, which is the nerves are not directly affected, but the tissue around it is affected and the inflammation or the stretching or the pressure, the compression of the tissue is causing the nerve to respond with a pain sensation. That is nociceptive pain. And neuropathic pain is when the nerve is directly affected at a disease or degeneration and is causing the pain. The surrounding tissue may not be inflamed. So naturally, the first type of pain is temporary. As soon as you treat the inflammation and other things revert to normal, the pain goes. But neuropathic pain is very difficult to treat. And that can be peripheral. It can be central or it can be a mixture of the two. 
Peripheral means the, the pain is not yet embedded in the sensory cortex. And if you treat the peripheral condition, like if, even if you put a drop of anesthesia, the pain goes, means it's peripheral pain. But if the pain doesn't go with topical anesthesia, it's embedded in the brain, and that is much more difficult to treat. And in some patients, you'll find part of the pain goes away, not all of it. So they have a mixed peripheral and central component to the pain. Um, if you do confocal microscopy of these patients with neuropathic pain, you'll see that that's how normal keratocytes look. They have markedly activated keratocytes. But more importantly, you will find that uh, they, uh, well, they have neuromas, but I'll show you a picture of that next. The subbasal plexus may be absent or may be increased. So you see the both kinds of extremes in these patients with neuropathic pain. But this is what is quite a pathognomic of these conditions. You get these neuromas, you get these elevation thickenings and of the nerves. So they are very, very sensitive and they can be of different kinds depending on the shape, the spindle neuromas, lateral neuromas or stump neuromas. Again, these neuromas are like the ones you see in amputated limbs, which can also be very painful. So there is a lot going on in the nerves in, in these patients. So when we look for nerve, the only thing we can do is test corneal sensation and you have to test in the four quadrants and the center, ask the patient to look in the distance, bring your cotton wisp from the side so it's not directly in the patient's line of vision and you can touch it and look for blinks. Now, remember the patient has normal blinks. So when the patient is blinking normally and you happen to touch coincidentally, it is not in response to your touch. So you have to do it a few times to make sure that the blink is actually in response to your touch and not a normal blink. And don't forget to touch conjunctival sensations as, uh, as well. And then you can do your, your anesthesia test if you want to. And of course, you want to start testing before you put the topical anesthetic drops. And these are the, the way we normally use it with the cotton vest. We have Cauchy Bonnet anesthesiometer, which is uh, something you use for semi quantitative assessment. And there are more sophisticated tools, the Belmonte, which uses jets of air and uh, carbon dioxide to change pH to cause sensations. But um, there is a commercially available prototype uh, now, but we don't have that. And this is was a video. I don't think it will work, or if it works, I'm not sure of how you tell it is. So this patient, you see, we're touching the center. Patients had absolutely no sensation, but he's trying to blink now and again. Uh, and uh, you can see completely anesthetic cornea. So we just quickly go through what is neuropathic, neurotrophic keratitis was the old word. Hence, it came under keratitis covered. So many people still call it neuropathic or neurotrophic keratopathy, but all these words, persistent epithelial defect, non healing defects, slow healing defects, clinically, they mean all the same thing. And you can use neurotrophic or neuropathic keratitis or keratopathy, but that's the term we prefer, neurotrophic keratopathy. And what is it by definition, clinically, a persistent epithelial defect an epithelial defect that does not heal or heals and breaks down repeatedly. And the definition of neurotrophic keratitis or keratopathy is a disease related to alteration in corneal nerves leading to impairment in sensory and trophic function with consequent breakdown of the corneal epithelium affecting health and integrity of the tear film, epithelium, and the stroma because the keratocytes are also affected. So fairly comprehensive definition of the word, but the key bit is that the sensations should be reduced or absent. All of that with reduced or absent sensation, then you've got a diagnosis of neurotrophic keratitis or keratopathy. Many, many causes for that. As you can see, huge list of operations uh, that we do uh, here all kinds of even squint surgery, cataract surgery, et cetera. And you can see even laser surgery. And when we do panretinal laser coagulation, we are damaging the long posterior ciliary nerves as they are coming in the suprachoroidal space to the front. So you can get a lot of corneal nerve dropout because of that. And, and you can see there are many other systemic conditions 
diabetes, leprosy, vitamin A deficiency, and so forth. So a huge number of conditions can lead eventually to NK. And the pathophysiology in this diagram we tried to uh, uh, show in the flow chart. So you have starting of an epithelial defect. This is for how this melting occurs, and that could be due to infection or trauma. Then you get immune cells coming uh, because of the inflammation. They're mostly neutrophils or macrophages. You get keratocyte activation or keratocyte loss due to apoptosis. Release of matrix metalloproteases, which cause digestion and stromal malting. But underlying all of these is that the corneal nerves are affected, hence the sensory and trophic functions are being affected. We classify neurotrophic keratopathy into three stages, mild, moderate, and severe. Straightforward, when there's epitheliopathy without a frank defect, it's mild. When there's a frank epithelial defect without stromal melt, it's moderate. When the stroma starts to melt, it is severe. And these are examples of only epitheliopathy, mild, epithelial defects without stromal melt, moderate, and epithelial defect with stromal melt, severe. But interestingly, if you do confocal microscopy and OCT, you find all three layers are affected in all stages. Clinically, on the slit lamp, that was the age-old classification. Still, we, we follow that. But just to tell you that the pathophysiology is more uh, deeper than that. So here you have what we would call stage one or mild, but you can see the epithelium is affected and the stroma is also affected on OCT and on confocal. The keratocytes are activated. In the moderate, there's epithelial defect. Again, a lot of the stroma is affected and they're activated keratocytes. And in the severe, of course, much more activation, actual stromal melt on OCT. So when you do, do OCT and confocal, you find is uh, the severity is different, the intensity is different, but all parts of the cornea are affected from the word go. These are some examples uh, of NK. Um, you can see this is from Zoster I showed you. This is a non-healing defect, uh, stem, cell, stem cell deficiency, rolled edges following chemical burn, acanthamoeba keratitis. The keratocytes are all eaten up by the acanthamoeba. Even after it's healed, the defect doesn't heal. And in cataract surgery, and this, this is something not many people know much about, is that if you change artificially and acutely the curvature of the cornea, so when we used to do extra capsular and put stitches on the top, you make it steep. Here's a corneal graft. The horizontal stitches have been removed. It is steep vertically. You get these defects. So the tear film distribution is altered. So acute alteration of the corneal curvature by surgery will result in uh, NK and, or non-healing defects. And here was following a trabeculectomy operation. So various different uh, causes and the treatment is, um, uh, it's, it can be quite elaborate, but there are principles I will explain to you. Medical treatment, non-surgical intervention, and then your surgery. So eliminate any cause. Example, the drugs, if patients are on drugs that cause dry eye uh, and the cholinergic drugs, or if there are sutures or tight sutures or loose sutures, Treat the underlying pathology. Sometimes there's subclinical infection. A lot of lubrication. The key word is any drops going in should be preservative free. And gels and ointments, sodium hyaluronate drops are good because they promote epithelial migration and attachment. We have inflammation because often there is an element of inflammation. So we have steroids, uh, topically, again, preservative free and cyclosporin, then you have the anti-LFA. These are all targeting specific molecules uh, of inflammation, and then metalloprotease inhibitors, which are the tetracyclines. So that's important. And you promote epithelial healing. with. You can use this coenzyme Q10. You can use the substrate promoters like the cassicol, the substrate regenerating agents, or serum drops, which brings in a lot of growth factors. And then we also have this now recombinant nerve growth factor, which is Sene German, uh, produced by a, a one company, but it's extremely expensive. And NICE did not approve it because of cost effectiveness. So it's not available in the UK market. 
uh, this regenerative agent is a uh, analog of heparin sulfate the only one that actually uh, targets the stroma rather than the epithelium so it builds these uh, collagen bridges or bridges between the collagen matrix so give the better surface for the cells to grow on uh, and then this Q coenzyme Q tear and the sodium hyaluronate promote the adhesions and of course the nerve growth factor uh, actually if there is conjunctival sensation present then you can induce nerve growth either from the conjunctival nerves or from some residual corneal nerves and we've seen this that when you treat them with the uh, senegerman the cornea not only the sensation recovers but on confocal you can show nerve regeneration but i think it was a two months treatment that can cause about cost about 20 or 30 thousand pounds um, now these charts are there this is all in in the uh, in the paper and it will be on this slide the principles here in this mild stage you have to stop it getting to the sex next stage and help it reverse to the normal stage so that's where you will do all those first things i said eliminate the inciting causes treat the inflammation and tear substitution punctal plug come in over here so you, you prevent breakdown of the epithelium into stage two but if it does go into stage two you're trying to treat it to reverse it to stage one and normal and prevent it going into stage three or that is severe and that's where the nerve growth factor comes in your serum drops your bandage contact lenses and non-surgical lid closure like with botulinum toxin or with the pad and bandage tarsorafi amniotic membrane all those things come over here you promote the healing and prevent it getting worse and when it does go into stage three then those treatments more of the same but if you get complications like gluing or like a perforation then you use gluing and amniotic membrane graft so those are the, the principles of treatment these are just some examples pad and bandage very effective in treating non uh, healing defects as long as you don't uh, put the patch on an open eye make sure the lid is closed you have the cross suture punctal plugs bandage contact lens tasarafi is the gold standard has to be done properly this was one patient said i showed you this cantomuba keratitis and suture tasarafi the suture had cut through and was rubbing on the eye causing more damage than good uh, tasarafi is the gold standard and one thing we'll mention that when you inject botul botulinum toxin and induced ptosis, the lid is completely covering the cornea, yet the defect doesn't heal as quickly as when you do a tarsorafi. And what might be the reason is that the botulinum toxin also affects secretion of tears, um, which the tarsorafi will not. And maybe that's why tarsorafi works better. And we've seen this with amniotic membrane graph. I've showed you these pictures before with, uh, with uh, zoster keratitis, how you can help that to heal as in this patient. And again, this patient with amniotic membrane graft. This is one other treatment where you have severe chemical burn with neurotrophic keratopathy. We tried amniotic membrane, it failed, but this is our innovation. Uh, and again, it's all been published. You take an autologous conjunctival graft from the other eye and you stitch it to the edges where there is vascularized cornea. These vessels connect with vessels in the conjunctiva. They bring vasculature to where it wasn't. And when these vessels settle initially, they undergo what's called reperfusion injury. But these are, remember, normal vessels, which were hypoxic when you cut the graft and brought it, even the few minutes it took to stitch, the vessels will make connection in a few hours or a day or two. They will go through these hypoxic vessels, which dilate, they transudate, they hemorrhage, but then it all settles. And you can, that eye, which was otherwise doomed to fail, we look at the amount of ischemia, becomes like this. And we've got, uh, uh, we took out this conjunctival graft after a year, used it to repair a simblephron, and did an autolimbal transplant. And without a corneal graft, we were able to get the patient 612 plus vision in that eye. And again, these are therapeutic uh, grafts that we would do. Uh, remember that when the sensations are poor, the wound healing is poor and the grafts can fail. So in a hypostatic cornea, the risk factor of failure is not rejection, 
it is lack of wound healing that has to be borne in mind in your planning and your counseling to the patient uh, gluing we've told you which can be infected again you've seen this before and eventually stem cell transplantation in these very uh, severe cases of uh, non-healing defects so in summary nk is the end result of a multitude of conditions the signs affects tears epithelium and stroma symptoms range from absent aberrant to increased sensation and we mentioned this stain with pain stain without pain and pain without stain can be facets of the same spectrum of the disease neuropathic corneal pain is a serious issue so in the management you need the correct diagnosis try and find the underlying condition treat associated conditions like your diet diabetes you know, so you need to treat systemic conditions as well use unpreserved drops as much as possible use the lubricant drops the antibiotics and the anti-inflammatory agents that you have both topical and systemic autologous serum plasma uh, the platelet rich plasma is another one widely used then you have this nerve growth factor which is more recent the interventions are bandage contact lens padding punctal plugs botox and the cross suture glue some people glue the lids together rather than suture it and the surgical treatment tarsorophy amniotic membrane graft autologous conjunctival grafts cornea transplant and limbal transplant thank you